Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Ah. And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, July 14th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, professor of history from Princeton University, CNN contributor too, I think, Professor Julian Zelizer on burning down the house, Newt Gingrich, the fall of a speaker, and the rise of a new Republican Party. Meanwhile, 5.4 million Americans have lost their private health insurance since March, White House, uh, the White House, with the imminent end of the federal expansion of unemployment insurance, ending, White House, White House is backing off its complete opposition to extended unemployment, but holding fast against a livable benefit. Meanwhile. As most U.S. parents fear a return to school for their kids, L.A. and San Diego say no school in the fall. California shuts down its bars and indoor dining amidst a coronavirus surge. Joe Biden to call for trillions of dollars in a total green energy conversion by 2035. Also, he says he's open to getting rid of the filibuster. It's primary day in Alabama, Texas, and Maine. Find out if those uh, Trump-supported candidates win. 17 states sue the Trump administration over an ICE rule expelling international students. Meanwhile, in the House, Joaquin Castro announces his attempt to dislodge Dem Warhawks from the Foreign Affairs Committee leadership. Tucker Carlson heads on vacay in wake of his non-apology for having a racist incel head writer. And Trump's Treasury Department buried investigations into racist lending practices. Can you imagine... Lastly, an Obama-appointed federal judge strikes down Georgia's anti-abortion law. All this and more on today's program. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, Happy uh, Tuesday, as it were, I guess, as we, uh, uh, you know, we should really have done a, a day. We should be doing like a rolling day of um of our pandemic at least in this country um still have uh, massive problems in in uh in in many of the states across the country it's increasing in all but i think one or two um the infection rate more or less but uh in some areas obviously significantly more someone chastised me in the emails uh for saying california was surging when in fact it's it's Southern California. Um, that may be the case. But nevertheless, uh, California has rolled back it, it, its opening. Uh, in Texas, there are increasing reports of ICUs um, at capacity. Florida, same. Of course, uh, we all have an opportunity now to go to Disneyland. That's exciting. 
Uh, 5.4 million Americans have lost their private health insurance since um, since March. A uh, Families USA found that the estimated increase in uninsured laid off workers over the three month period was nearly 40 percent higher than the highest previous increase, which occurred during the recession of 2008 and 2009. This is uh, interesting. In the 37 states that expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, 23% of laid off workers became uninsured. Now, that, zero sh- that number should be zero. Just to be clear, the, the idea that that number would be acceptable um, is absurd and grotesque. But the percentage was nearly double that in the 13 states that did not expand Medicaid. So there is a material difference um, between those states that had expanded under Medicaid and those that had not. And what we should have is a single payer health care system so that we wouldn't even have this conversation. Among other things. Uh, but that is it. Half of the coverage losses in the pandemic came from five states, California, Texas, Florida, New York, and North Carolina. And um, you have those states couldn't be handling this uh, more differently, I think. Um, uh, let's move on to that question of, of schooling. San Diego and uh, L.A., said they're not going to have any school in the fall. These are two of the biggest school districts in the country, New York City being the biggest. There's 1.3 million students, I think, who go to uh, public schools in uh, in New York City. And um, here is just how... Now, this listen, there is a very, very significant debate about this there's a story in the daily beast today uh israel had got their cases down to like uh, uh, nearly zero not quite zero but nearly zero in the country they reopened their schools they did it at first like in like a halfway measure and then they went full bore and then uh they had a surge and like 40 percent of the uh, new cases that they got came from schools But there are other countries that have been able to do uh, have been able to open their schools. They're without any uh, without the the students being vectors. Then there's that story I read from Syracuse four or five days ago. Daycare center. Mom comes in waiting for her test results. And uh, she's infected. She doesn't know it. Kids there. Kids infected. Four or five other kids get infected. Other adults. So. Very difficult to uh, to parse this out. The Fox and Friends folks managed to make it one of the dumbest debates you could possibly imagine in virtually no time. Here is um, here is the crew. Although I guess Ainsley Earhart is on vacation with uh, with Hannity or something. So here is uh, here's the crew. Hey, if Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Switzerland, Greece, and Germany can do it. Can America do it? Nothing's easy. We could find a way to do it, get protocols together. The Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, Dr. Atlas, they're all saying there's risk, but there's more of a risk keeping your kids out of school. Send them to school. Yeah, Meanwhile, but, but Brian, at the same time, how many politics are involved in those other countries? I don't know. Is it I, an election year? I have no Does idea. Does it have anything to do with it? Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, it, it's just so ridiculous to keep a kid out of school for an entire year. You have to understand, you have to have, uh, you have to have that factor in. And if politics plays a role, we'll know on November 3rd. If on November 5th, all of a sudden, L.A. finds they got to go to school if Joe Biden wins. And in Oakland, they find that all the kids got to go right away uh, back to school shopping. We'll know politics played a role, but it'll be too late for the country. Well, actually, even if that ridiculously stupid scenario happened, the idea that kids are going to start school two months later, I would take that. If it is somehow miraculously not as much of a danger to to the kids, 
and particularly to the teachers and the staff and parents. I'd take a two month delay. Are you kidding? Of course. I but that's the dumbest possible. <laughs> the idea that this is about there's, a, you know, here is Kilmeade had the answer without even realizing it. He said, if Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Switzerland, Greece, and Germany can, can do it, can't America do it? And the answer is more than likely no, because there is no federal assistance to doing any of this. We can't even, we can't even get people to agree on masks, for God's sakes. And, I, and largely because of their network. I would point out that uh, there are, in fact, politics happening in Europe this year. So what there are, there are <laughs> politics. It's absurd. They could ding, vote ding, for ding, a ding. vote in the, all these parliamentary systems. They could vote for a vote of no confidence, but virtually any time. D ding, ding, ding. What a bunch of idiots. Yeah. That ding, ding comment is like something you expect a very dumb relative who just watches Fox news to say, not like Ex the actual, exactly. Mm. Like they're, they're, they're no, now, it's the first thing <laughs> they're now like eating their own pre-digested gruel. They're actually like, it's like, they're actually like spewing it out. This is, we're not even going to give you the pre-digested one. We're going to give you the one that's pre-digested and then been digested again. It's like a cow's cud or something. And, and, and the amazing thing here is that like, they know that the administration has been hell bent on pretending none of this is existing. The reason why these other countries can do it to the extent that they can is because they have had a concerted response that has been intelligent and involved federal spending and they have all of this infrastructure and they have some sort of cohesion in their country. They don't have lunatics who think that wearing a mask is some type of uh, freedom infringement or that they're gonna get CO2 poisoning from wearing a mask. As if they've never even seen, like, I don't know, they, a doctor TV show. Like, do, do, do people really think that doctors would go through surgery if they were getting CO2 poisoning throughout the whole thing with masks on? It's absurd. Do people not realize the basic science of, of that CO2 uh, molecules are, are like, are, are, are atomic in their size. They go right through a mask. As opposed to a virus, which is, you know, like, is, I don't know. I, I don't know the specific, is, is it like a hundred thousand times larger, a million times larger than a CO2? I mean, it's, you know what a CO2 uh, molecule is made of? CO2, period. <laughs> it's tiny. God, the, the level of idiocy that has brought us to this point is historic. I'm glad we have uh, Julian on today. Maybe he can sort of like give us a view from the future. What will future historians say how dumb we were in this situation? Uh, sorry, I'm a little riled up today. But um, as you know, for all our sakes, we need to avoid crowds in any way we can right now. Uh, but what if you need to go to the post office? What if you need postage? Send out letters and packages. Well, I have a solution for you. Don't worry about it. Stamps.com is here to help. Stamps.com, you can print postage on demand. You do it right on your computer. Skip those lines and crowds at the post office. You can personally print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, for any package, for any class of mail, for anywhere. So if you're like me and you're awake for God knows why from like three to five every morning, well, this time it was because my kid woke me up. Go up, you print your, uh, your, your package uh, postage or your letter postage. Then all you do is hopefully wake up in time for the mail carrier to come. Or you just schedule a free package pickup or you drop it in a mailbox, however you do it. You don't, no human contact required. That's my favorite thing. And if you're a small business person sending invoices, if you're an online seller, like my daughter apparently selling out Depop stuff, just working from home, you need to mail stuff, stamps.com can handle it all with ease. Stamps.com, you get great discounts too. Five cents off a very first class stamp, up to 62% off of shipping rates. 
And now stamps.com also has UPS service with up to discounts of up to 62%. You won't even have to pay UPS residential sur surcharges. And now listeners of this program get a special offer. It includes a four week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long term commitment. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Majority Report. That's stamps.com. Enter the code Majority Report. Check it out. Also, this is a uh, new product. I don't know if I've talked about this before, but I've had it and I've been using it actually for months. That didn't even occur to me. I was wondering, like, where did I get this? Uh, I'm talking about my new deodorant. I don't know if I've advertised this before. Maybe it's been a while. But longtime listeners know that I have always been very skeptical of deodorant. And um, because I just don't want any of that, uh, the garbage that they put in there. I don't know if, I don't know if like what they say about it is true, but I just, am I, I'm just, I'm not down with it. Uh, when I read a label of deodorant, if it's got any of that, like, aluminum stuff or whatever forget it won't do it well that's why um i'm using native deodorant it has ingredients you've actually heard of like coconut oil or shea butter tapioca starch which to be honest with you i had never heard of before it's vegan it's never tested on animals and the best part about this is switching from an aluminum free deodorant doesn't mean you have to sacrifice in terms of protecting yourself from smelling bad. Native keeps you smelling and feeling fresh all day. They got 10 cents. They have rotating seasonals. They got coconut and vanilla, lavender and rose. I would never, ever do, as you know. But uh, I know people like that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Peppermint, I like that one. Citrus and herbal, to name a few. And they have unscented, which, of course, is my favorite. Native is risk-free to try. Every product comes with free shipping in the U.S., plus a 30-day return and exchange. For me, I think people know I am a uh, almost primarily unscented person. I don't like smells that much. Uh, but coconut and the cucumber mint, I've tried it. I like them both. I will mix that up if I feel like I want to actually smell like something. But in the main... And I got the sensitive, they have one for sensitive skin. For me, I'm unscented, sensitive skin. That's just the way I am. So do what I did. Make the switch to native today by going to nativedeo, nativedeo.com slash majority. Use the promo code majority at checkout. You get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash majority. Use promo code majority at checkout. Get 20% off your first order. Also, uh, lastly, uh, I know your routines are changing, but maybe you're not going out as much. There's never been a better time to learn something new. You got thousands of options available. Finding the best way to learn can be challenging. My recommendation, an app called Blinkist. Blinkist is unique. It's powerful. It works on your phone, your tablet, your web browser, wherever you want to take it. It has the key insights of over 3,000 nonfiction bestsellers in over 27 categories, condenses them down into what they call blinks, and you can read or listen to them in just 15 minutes. Now Blinkist offers its members exclusive original podcasts from top authors and creative thinkers. You can also dive deeper into full-length nonfiction audiobooks at a special discounted price. Matt? Over 14 million people use Blinkist to deepen their knowledge in topics spanning from self-improvement, management, happiness, and more. But there's also ones that are history. Uh, I mean, there are books that I have read. I mean, for me, I've told you th this before. My strategy with Blinkist is like, are there books that I sort of feel like I should read, but I don't want to read? Or are there books that like, I'm not, I'm not really interested in the prose of, of, in the, in the writing style of someone who's going to tell me how to like be more efficient in, um, you know, in, in, in managing my time. Those are the type of things with all due respect to Tim Ferriss. I didn't want to read the whole book. I did the four hour work week and I did it as a Blinkist, but also I read that, uh, well, I didn't read it. I did the Blinkist of everything Trump touches dies by Rick Wilson. I want to see how sincere that guy was. And I'm thinking of checking in Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, because why not? It only take me 15 minutes to either listen or read. 
Right now, Blinkist has a special offer for everybody in our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Majority Report. Start your free seven-day trial. You get 25% off. That's You get a, a free seven-day trial, and then they give you 25% off the Blinkum Premium Membership, Blinkist Premium Membership, and you get up to 65% off your audiobooks, which you can keep forever, Matt Leck. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash Majority Report to get 25% off a premium membership and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Majority Report. As always, we will put all of those ads uh, in our podcast description, our YouTube description. Uh, also, I should remind you, uh, this show is uh, supported by our members. And if you want the show commercial free, you can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. In the meantime, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Princeton professor of history, Julian Zelizer, on burning down the house. Newt Gingrich, the fall of the speaker and the rise of the new Republican Party. We'll be right back after this. Back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure. It is a pleasure to bring back to re, uh, to have back on the program the uh, Princeton and, and not the I guess a but for me the Princeton uh, professor of history on his uh, new book "Burning Down the House: Newt Gingrich, the Fall of a Speaker." and the rise of a new republic of the new republican party julian zelizer welcome back to the program thanks for having me sam great to be with you so uh newt gingrich now i gotta say um i have the book here uh i i you know i knew a little bit of newt i've been following his career for quite some time obviously and um there was a lot of stuff in here I didn't realize. Let's I I want to I mean I want to I want I want to broaden this out. I mean this is a book really about uh in many respects about personalities, but I do ultimately want to broaden it out a little bit. But uh just tell us um I did not realize and I'm really uh, hurt by this that I didn't realize this that he married his own math uh his 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 high school math teacher. Um and uh, I knew everything else about how he ditched her. Uh, when she had cancer, but tell us, give us a little bit about just like his, his bio. I, and I, I think I had forgot that he became a congressman uh, as early as 1978. So just uh, uh, give us a little bit of where he's coming from. Yeah, this guy, he, I mean, he was born in Harrisburg, right outside Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, working class, conservative area. Uh, his dad, his biological dad, left his mom uh, while uh, she was pregnant, and he grew up uh, with his stepdad. It was in the military as an army brat, so he moved around Europe, lived in many different places until they finally settled in Georgia. Uh, and in high school, in, in late high school, he starts uh, dating uh, secretly his high school math teacher. And when he goes to Emory after high school, 
uh, she goes with him and she gets a job there and, and they will get married. And uh, his personal life starts in, in a bit of a turmoil situation. His stepfather disapproved of this. Um, Gingrich gets a PhD in history at Tulane. He gets a job in West Georgia College, but he doesn't want to be an academic. And so he runs for Congress in 74 and 76 against an old Southern Dixiecrat, uh, Congressman John Flint. And then finally, Flint retires, and in 1978, he wins in a pretty blistering campaign against someone named Virginia Shepard. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about uh, how he won that race against, um, um, but but let's just talk about like his impetus to become a, a, a congressman, because the thing about Gingrich is he doesn't seem to care. Like, you know, there has been some of the biggest right wing personalities, I feel, don't really seem to care that much about conservative policy in any uh, fashion. You know, like I'm thinking like like a guy like uh, like Breitbart, for instance, who couldn't you could he there wasn't a single policy that he would advocate. He was just it was all for him. It was about this sort of culture on some level. And and Gingrich sort of like seems to have some of that. He almost like uses policy uh, in the way that some people use culture, he, he, he just wants power. Like how much insight do you have as to like what motivated him to become a congressman? Because it sort of feels like he want he wanted that idea of being a, uh, an academic where he gets to tell, you know, talk to, you know, has an audience every day in terms of his class, but then he didn't want to do the work. Yeah. I mean, he's, uh, until the mid seventies, even the first time he runs for the house seat, He's really a Rockefeller Republican. He's not particularly committed to, you know, a set of conservative ideas. He believes the Republican Party should be a broad coalition. He loved Nixon before Watergate because he thought that's exactly what Nixon was doing. And it's only in the mid 70s he starts to associate with the right wing conservative movement that's taking form. Uh, Look, broadly, he does accept the importance of tax cuts and deregulation and a strong defense. But within that, he's pretty flexible. And I think even though we think of him as this big ideas politician and he likes to present himself that way, the professor politician, really, he's exactly what you're saying. He's about getting power for the Republican Party and figuring out how to do that. That's been his central theme throughout his career. Uh, rather than as a fierce ideologue, the ideology, the policies, that's all in service of his partisan strategy. And all right, so talk about that first election that he wins, because that seems to be uh, largely a template for how he's going to do everything. Yeah, he runs against uh, someone named Virginia Shepard, who is in the state government. And she's actually a moderate Democrat, more conservative than him on a lot of fiscal issues. So he needs to figure out in 1978 how to basically uh, take her down. And at one moment, she says to a reporter that if she wins, she'll move to Washington and her family will stay in the district. Her husband had a job and she didn't see any need that he had to to lose that. So Gingrich just picks up on that. He hones right in on that statement. And he basically, he doesn't basically, he says she's going to break up her family for her professional aspirations. And she's uh, a radical because of this. And every campaign stop after that, he appears with his family surrounding him and makes himself the family uh, values candidate as a way to remind voters uh, of what he's saying about her. And it's it's a pretty brutal campaign. The Shepard campaign uh, people are just taken aback that he's doing this, but it works. He wins the seat. And and I mean that he's running. I mean, it's a it, it is it becomes a template for, for the modern Republican party in many respects. Right. I mean, like that, they, they, they did that to Hillary Clinton shortly, you know, I don't know how many years later it was, I guess, uh, you know, 15 years later, uh, that became the issue with Hillary Clinton that she was, you know, not going to stay in the kitchen. Well, yes, that's exactly right. And, and Gingrich is a storyteller. I mean, he believes that, from the start, the way to win in politics is to tell the story that sticks in the media and to make of your opponents uh, a caricature. And if it's well done, it's hard for them to undo and that the media will suck it up if it's done in blistering fashion. And so he, he does that particular template uh, with her and, and he'll continue with the Hillary Clinton. 
And then with Democrats, you know, he, he makes them into this corrupt establishment uh, that has absolutely no intrinsic value and is, is lining its pockets. And he's very good at putting people into that portrait. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about, okay, so he's, he comes in in 78, uh, of course, uh, Ronald Reagan, um, uh, becomes elected in 1980. What, um, he, he goes on to, uh, basically set up, I don't know, with this, is it like the, were there a lot of caucuses before this? He sets up like basically like his, you know, a, a prototype, it seems like uh, for the freedom caucus in a way. Yeah, caucuses are just taking form in the 70s, really. Um, the Congressional Black Caucus is one of the first big ones. There's something called the Democratic Study Group. Uh, and, and they're just starting to sprout. And he creates his own, the Conservative Opportunity Society, which is a small group of uh, Republicans like him who were as critical of their own leadership as they were the Democrats. And we're saying the party had to do anything, basically. They had to go there to win. And we have to remember the House of Representatives had been controlled by Democrats since 1954. So in their minds, unless the party was willing to be much more radical in its tactics, the GOP would forever be a minority party. So this group, the Congressional, the COS, as a shorthand, becomes his, his team. They are his allies. And through them, he starts to conduct his wars. I mean, this is the thing that I think is really sort of fascinating is that it is, again, it is structured around this idea of how to win as opposed to what to win. That, that's true. Uh, I mean, I, I think that that's really important in terms of understanding him. Uh, a lot of the story that I tell is about him focusing on ethics and why Democrats are unethical, including the Speaker of the House. While he's doing this, he is accused all the time of unethical behavior, and he's being investigated for it. He doesn't care deep down about a lot of the issues that he focuses on. They are a means to an end, and it's about the winning. And uh, if there's a way to understand the Gingrich mentality through today in the GOP, it's partisanship above all else, including governance, including the needs of the institution. And you always make that the priority in what you're doing. And that also means a lot of your ideas and principles, they're flexible. And you'll move to the one that's more useful for you. Uh, hence, uh, burning down the house. <laughs> um, that's exactly right. A song that you know provides the perfect title. And that is what he wanted to do. He, he didn't believe there was an incremental way to defeat the Democrats. You had to take them down. Uh, and you also had to take down the institution as it operated. You had to change the basic rules of, of politics. And, and that's what he set out to do. And so, OK, so one of his um, one of his targets uh, early on was actually um, or I guess maybe the, the focus of his ire uh, was a guy named Bob Michael, who was the and, and people should I, I should remind people the Democrats controlled the House from for about what 40 some odd years more yeah since 1954 so Great. so they they controlled it from 54 until 90 uh 95 i guess it was yeah. um yeah. and so uh, people have to understand it in that context that the in many respects the the democrats had ossified it it you know as far as i can recall uh, and there was, you know, a there was a real sort of like transactional quality to everything. Right. And and there was a lot of like sort of um, good old boy quality to all of it, it, it seems to me. And Gingrich came in and he had a real problem with Bob Michael, who was the minority leader of the Republicans. I mean, it, it, was this was this. Is this like an anti-establishment thing or is this more like, you know, I don't know, uh, here's the new boss, same as the old boss type of situation? Well, the anti-establishment rhetoric was something Gingrich is very deliberate about this. And he argued this is the rhetoric Republicans have to use uh, in the aftermath of Watergate and Vietnam. There's a lot of distrust in this country. A lot of it had been focused on Republicans. But he says, let's turn it on the Democrats. Let's use this as the main argument to go after the Democratic Party. And they had been in power so long. Everything you said is true. 
And so they were vulnerable. And he thought that was a much more effective kind of rhetoric than even liberal versus conservative, right versus left, establishment versus anti-establishment, almost capitalize on the ethos of the 60s and use it against the party of liberalism. But that also meant going after Republicans like Bob Michael, who were comfortable in the system, uh, who believed still in the importance of governing and being able to make decisions and pass legislation, but he was gonna have to change their way or even take them down eventually if his style was going to win. So he's, he's known in the 80s as a guy who's just as dangerous to his own party as he is to the Democrats. Um, and, and so I think, I, I, again, it's, it's a tactic, but it's a tactic based on some truth uh, that he sensed in how Washington worked. You know, um, that, that, that the, the, the notion of his anti-establishmentarianism, I guess, coming out of the 60s, um, that story about, um, what was it called? Um, uh, cam scam. Um, yeah. Cam scam reminded me of like something that Abby Hoffman would have done. You know what I mean? Like there was some, there was a, there was a yippee quality to that. Um, I mean, obviously there's a lot of, but, but like just the ability of like, we're going to make the system work on itself. Like it reminded me in, in some way of like going into wall street and throwing, uh, and throwing cash everywhere. But, but just uh, tell us that story. Cause it's, it's, I think it shows how media savvy and how much he knew uh, this was really about um, how to tell a story. Yeah, I mean, in 1984, he, he and this group, uh, COS, they're trying to figure out a way to get known and get their message out. And then he says, you know, there's this channel called C-SPAN that had been created in 1979 when the House finally allowed cameras to cover what they were doing. It was a sunshine reform, throw light onto Washington. And what Gingrich and his allies do is they, they go uh, on the floor at the end of every day when any member, even someone who doesn't have power is allowed to make a short one minute speech. And they started making a speech every single day at the end, end of the day. And the speeches were blistering. They were attacking Democrats for being weak on defense, saying the whole party didn't really care about the security of this country. They weren't supporting Reagan's war against communism in Central America. And it got even worse as the speeches progressed. They started calling out specific Democrats and saying, is this all true about you? And why don't you respond? And if you were watching C-SPAN, you saw no one respond. It, it looked like the Democrats had zero answers to the charge. Uh, but what you couldn't see, because the camera only showed the person speaking, was that the chamber was 100% empty. There was no one there. Uh, and, and it was a kind of Abby Hoffman-like political theater but carried out on a national stage on this new medium of cable television. And the story progresses, Speaker Tip O'Neill gets so mad, he comes in and he orders the cameras to show the chamber so that viewers could see this is all just not true. It's, it's kind of a made up uh, situation. And even then Gingrich turns it on him and he says, look at the speaker, he's violating the rules which say, say you can't sh show the chamber. He's an autocrat. He's a, you know, tyrannical. He, he kind of quickly uses that and gets that rhetoric out there. And then the whole thing ends with O'Neill making this blistering speech about Gingrich saying, this is McCarthyism. It's the lowest thing he's seen in Washington. And the Republicans actually are able to strike uh, the speaker's words from the record and say they were inappropriate. And again, it showed just how far the Democrats are willing to go. Uh, and it all culminates with the networks covering this, meaning Gingrich, who is still pretty unknown, uses this cam scam incident, uses this controversy to get on the national networks, on national newspaper stories, and he had arrived. He gives them conflict and the media can't resist. Uh, and, and that is something he does again and again and again. And and then um, uh, within a couple of years, it's basically, you know, we get to, uh, in many respects, the sort of the pivot point of your book uh, where he um, uh, not single handedly, but he is the um, he basically goes after um, Jim Wright, who is uh, or I should say. Um, yeah, he goes after Jim Wright, um, who is the um, uh, the Speaker of the House after Tip O'Neill uh, steps down in 80, 87. Uh, and um, 
this is where he basically hones and 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 I you know I I was in college at that time. I don't remember, you know, I, I vaguely remember all of it happening. I just wasn't as in, you know, uh, wasn't uh, paying as much attention uh, at the time. But it, it, it struck me as how effective, because I'm quite convinced that although the Iraq war was a very big part of it, the Democrats took back the House in 2006 because of corruption. And the, the salience of corruption in that it, it talk about uh, about his attack on Jim Wright, but then also talk about this sort of like, you know, historically, has corruption always been this effective? It is a big issue. I mean, this is a country which was founded uh, not only about fears of centralized power, but also fears of corrupt power. So I think at some level it resonates. Um, and that's how Gingrich then went after Jim Wright. Jim Wright was an old school Democrat. Uh, he had been majority leader for 10 years. He had been pretty tough with Republicans. He, he felt like he was fighting a, a last stand for liberalism, especially in the 1980s. So uh, a lot of Republicans didn't like him so much. Uh, and there have been stories in the national and Texas press about Speaker Wright, about Jim Wright about some relations he had with business people in his district that seemed a little shady. He had a, a book of speeches, uh, a, a thin little book, but he would sell them in bulk whenever he spoke to big groups. Uh, and it was because you could only earn so much in speaking fees, but you could earn all you want as a legislator through book royalties. And, and what Gingrich did is he took these kinds of stories, which were, they didn't look good, but they, they weren't, you know, another Watergate. But he kept saying this is the most corrupt speaker in American history. And he took bits and pieces of the stories and blew it up into a kind of scandal frenzy in Washington. Now, and ultimately, the House Ethics Committee starts an investigation uh, and finds that there might be something there. They, they need to keep looking and, and look more seriously. Uh, but the pressure builds so badly before any investigation is done and completed Wright will resign. And so he uses this fear of corruption, the ethical rules that were put into place after Watergate as a way to reform Washington, and the investigative journalism that was starting to come out also the post Woodward and Bernstein era after Watergate. And he uses all this to again, like in 78, draw a portrait of basically a criminal in the speaker seat. Uh, and it's pretty devastating. All right. Let's talk about, though, the the Democrats reaction, like the way the Democrats handled this, because that this that dynamic where you have and, and we should say uh, Newt Gingrich, every single thing that he accused Wright of doing or the uh, that came up on ethics, he was doing himself, maybe more. Uh, also, not to mention, you know, like we saw this uh, with um, with the impeachment on some level. So. It is not just it's not a question of there. There's an asymmetry in terms of like, um, you know, how dirty one party or the other was. Uh, but this the way the Democrats reacted and the way the Republicans worked, that dynamic seems to have been like dipped in amber and has existed, it seems to me, up until I'm going to say like maybe 2018. I mean, like, like, talk about their response because I, 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 like, I feel like this, this, this movie plays over and over again. Absolutely. I mean, whenever you focus on an individual who has a big impact, you think about the reactions of the people he worked with. Uh, the reaction of Republicans in my book is the party leaders embrace him, and even though they say this guy's toxic, it's dangerous, he's a new Joe McCarthy, they say, well, let's let him in the doors and we'll work with him. The reaction of Democrats is, is simply not, no, they're, they're kind of totally caught off guard. Uh, they don't know how to handle him. They don't know what he's up to in the media. They don't know how to really handle the fact that he is, he's, he's guilty of exactly what he's accusing uh, Jim Wright of. Some would say even worse, at the time this is all unfolding. I mean, within the months leading into Wright's resignation, there's an investigation, a newspaper report that Gingrich himself had an unethical book deal and he raised money from interest groups to promote the thing. Uh, and he has to have a press conference, several about this. And uh, 
um, you know, Gingrich just says it's different, it's not relevant, and the Republicans stand by him. Democrats essentially give up right. They start to put pressure on him to step down. Uh, they start to whisper to the media, I think it's time for him to go. Uh, and so in terms of the resolve of the parties, there's a, a difference then that goes through today. Uh, and in terms of what they were willing to do, the Democrats are still more restrained in terms of even how they will go after Gingrich than Gingrich is about going after them. And the parties have not embraced the same kind of partisanship since that period. Uh, maybe it's changing in 2018, but the party is much more checked as a whole than Republicans who loved what Gingrich did. And they've said, let's just go all out, forget the guardrails and, and let's tear things down. And, and it's an asymmetry uh, through and through. It's I mean, is from your perspective, is the asymmetry just a function of this dynamic where, you know, ultimately Democrats you know, uh, there's different uh, sort of like ideologies, I think, within the Democratic Party. But ultimately, they all want government to work in some fashion. And conservatives, Republicans, they are happy to have the destruction of government because it's always an impediment, you know, uh, on some level to to their interests. Is that is that the only asymmetry? I think that's the bit, the most important one. I mean, the the point of the Gingrich story, and certainly someone will probably write it about President Trump, is that when you let partisanship run free and, and when you avoid or eliminate any kind of countervailing uh, thoughts that a politician has, such as I also have to be able to govern, I need to make sure the institutional working and isn't destroyed. When you put those totally aside, and you let partisanship run amok, uh, the threat is that government becomes dysfunctional. And you have two parties with two different philosophies. Democrats, center and left, still all at some level believe in the importance of government, the value of government and government as a first line in dealing with some of the problems we face as a society. So you can't ultimately embrace a level of partisanship will destroy the ability of that government to work. Uh, but Republicans are fine with that, uh, especially as the Republicans have moved rightward. This function fulfills everything they say about government. It doesn't work. It's not useful. Uh, and so I think that's part of why the parties are different. And, and then part of it, uh, kind of the impact of leaders from Gingrich to Trump, they have also legitimized, you know, legitimate that kind of thinking within their party. I, I mean, I can't help to be, I mean, I, I mean, I agree. I think that is a, a big tenant, but I can't help. Like, I, so for instance, in fact, today, Joe Biden has come out and said, I'm open to uh, getting rid of the filibuster for legislation, right? Chris Coons um, uh, said it a couple of weeks ago, which I think was the, uh, which was basically tipping the hand. Chris Coons is, you know, uh, as you know, Biden's one of his top surrogates, maybe his only surrogate. I don't know. Um, and, uh, and, um, and he signaled that he did. Now he signaled that he did. He, he was open to it because it wasn't Bernie Sanders as the nominee, right? Like, I mean, if Bernie Sanders is the nominee, Chris Coons still thinks that as an institutionalist, we need to keep the um, the uh, we need to keep the the filibuster here. So I I wonder, and I know this is a little bit outside of uh, of the scope of your book. But you've written a lot of, uh, of, of books about, about Democrats as well, uh, or a lot about Democrats, I should say. Um, um, isn't there also some notion of like the relationship between the bases that, that, that is different between the parties? You know, Chris Coons wants to keep the filibuster if he is equally afraid of, and maybe more so afraid of what the left flank of the Democratic Party is going to do without it than he is with what the Republicans will do without it. Well, I think uh, what you're saying at some level is that in the GOP, the base now controls the party. And um, this is also part of the story of the last four decades where the Republicans move much more, not only sharply to the right than Democrats do to the left, as, but as a whole, they move together. There's just much less division. 
Democrats are still much more of a divided party, even in this partisan age. And so then some of these tactical considerations are going to be different. And uh, that's exactly what you're arguing uh, with Coons, with Sanders. Those divisions just are not really as much of a factor. Everyone's on board in the GOP uh, with, with Trump, with Mark Meadows, uh, now chief of staff before the head of the Freedom Caucus. And when you don't have those divisions, when you are truly uh, party united, I think you're willing to move much farther and take bigger risks um, than you are if you're still divided. And the amazing thing is, I think the Republican Party um, is united simply around power. I mean, I know like this is a, you know, to say that about a, a political party is is incredibly hackneyed. Um, it's said every day on right wing radio. And um, but I mean, Mark Meadows was, like you say, a Freedom Caucus guy. And he has presided over, or, you know, at least he's been there for a couple of months anyways. He's joined an administration that is, um, you know, I have no problem with them spending. I think they should spend more. Uh, but the, the, they, were, they threatened out to shut down the government because of what now amounts to a minuscule deficit relative to what it is now. Like, there doesn't seem to be a single principle that they have maintained other than uh, you know, destruction of government and maybe uh, at the behest of, of wealthy people. Well said uh, and a fair point. Uh, I mean, I think there are certain threads you could probably see in the party. One is a, a supply side approach to all economic policy. Uh, and I think a general attack on the social safety net. And now you could argue white backlash politics is becoming pretty integral to what the party is about. But but outside of that, I think the principles are hard to see. Uh, they're, they're, they are Gingrich-like in that they are forms of rhetoric rather than genuine policy preferences, fiscal conservatism, family values. All of that you'll hear again and again going into 220, but it doesn't really match a lot of what the party is about. And and that is related to a party where partisanship is the guiding principle. And if you have that principle, not only are you willing to threaten the institutions of our democracy, you're also willing to go against what you're promising to voters with great ease, uh, with, with amazing ease, uh, because you're not committed to that. You're committed to holding the reins of power. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, go pack. And this is sort of after, um, uh, Gingrich uh, gets his his big scalp, um, and 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 in the early '90s, he forms this uh, pack, and uh, I, I, I mean I'm really interested in his relationship with Frank Luntz, where that leads to, and also his relationship with talk radio, which really begins to explode after the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, it, Reagan kills the Fairness Doctrine. And you start to see it really grow. I mean, Limbaugh comes on the scene, I think it was in 88-ish. Um, yep. But uh, Talk about that, because he immediately realizes the value of that. And then we should probably also throw in Atwater, because in some ways, Atwater, Atwater learns from Gingrich as much as Gingrich learns from Atwater, it feels like. True. So GoPak's actually created in the early 80s, and Gingrich takes it over from uh, DuPont uh, in 1984, it's a defunct organization, and Gingrich turns it into a real important part of his platform. It's basically a way to communicate with other Republicans, candidates. He sends out uh, videos. He sends out memos about what to say, what to do in front of the media. And when he starts teaming up with Frank Luntz, they start really perfecting uh, uh, suggestions about rhetoric. And, and just as a taste, they, they let one out in 1990, which goes to Republican candidates running in the midterm. And the memo, it's one of the most famous. It's called Language, a Key Mechanism of Control. And it says, if, if you're a Republican who thinks, I wish I could speak like Newt, they say you have to use the following words to talk about Democrats. Corruption, traitors, sick, radical, shame, pathetic, steal, and lie. Uh, and, and that's a flavor of, of what he did with this. And ultimately, GoPak will 
bring him uh, into ethical trouble um, because he uses it for his own campaign. He becomes the first speaker in American history who is uh, reprimanded and fined for ethics violations, ironically enough. Um, the talk radio is also important. He's at the forefront of talk radio and it's just growing. Uh, important to remember, he precedes really the growth of conservative talk radio. And a lot of what you hear on the airwaves is very Gingrich-like. Uh, but when he's speaker in 94 and 95, he works closely with Rush and, and they actually focus on messaging and themes of the day and the Republican leadership and, and a lot of conservative talk radio hosts work hand in hand in a way which we see with uh, Fox News all the time. Uh, but you know, uh, Lee Atwater finally uh, is also part of this same world. And, and one moment in my story is 1988 when George H.W. Bush is starting his campaign, he's the epitome of the old guard civil Republican. But Lee Atwater, who's a South Carolina, Carolinian, really fierce campaigner who, who loves wrestling and thinks politics is like wrestling, he starts to introduce Gingrich's attacks on Jim Wright into the campaign. And Bush starts to talk about them before much of Washington thinks this is acceptable. Um, and, and the Atwater-Gingrich relation is about how the party leaders and the maverick political bomb throwers, you know, merged together by 1988 and 1989. So all of this is a huge infrastructure of Republican politics, the media, the campaign, the congressional politics that I think really created the foundation of the current presidency. Um, and, and you, you do open the book up, uh, with, um, uh, Gingrich being essentially vetted, uh, for the, uh, vice presidency. Um, I, I just want to touch also on this, on the, uh, on the, on the contract for America, because, um, that was a document there, you know, there's a, I, I'm seeing this like as a strategy now, and I, it really becomes clear, uh, to me in the context of the Lincoln project, actually, you know, you see like the Lincoln project is out there doing these ads. They're the never Trumpers. They're Republicans who are, or, you know, are, are espousing, uh, you know, telling uh, Republicans not to vote for, uh, for, uh, for Trump, but rather vote for Biden. I am very skeptical as to their efficacy in terms of changing anybody's minds for votes, but they seem to be very effective in making it seem like they're changing people's minds for votes and that 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 the the value of what they're doing to them has more to do after the fact so that they can claim part of the mandate uh, if joe biden gets one and it feels like that's what the contract of america for america or with america was about too that came in late nobody voted nobody came and pulled the le lever uh, for Republicans because of the contract for America. I, I, barely people were even aware of it before the election, were they? No, it was, it was really a campaign ploy. It, it was done at the end. I think it was really targeting the media rather than the voters. Uh, I mean, it, look, it, it, was, it was distributed. This is a contract which listed a, a set of principles Republicans promised to put into place if they won. It was a way to almost nationalized the election and compete with Bill Clinton. Um, and it was put out in TV guide and it was a tear out sheet that voters uh, were able to um, uh, put on their refrigerator as a reminder uh, for what Republicans would do. But the real target were reporters. It was a way to get attention for what Republicans were about, to get coverage of this story. They appear on Capitol Hill with the contract of America. Uh, and, and get some uh, good stories out of that. And I think that's ultimately what it was. None of it ever comes into being. Uh, and so once again, um, I think it, it reflects some of the thinness of some of the promises that are made in this era. All right. So talk about his, uh, his uh, Gingrich's ultimate fall. He is really just disliked by a lot of people. And when he becomes less effective, um, he's summarily booted. Yes. So uh, he leads the impeachment against Bill Clinton. The House is getting ready to vote on the impeachment, which revolves around Clinton's uh, affair and with we should, Monica Lewinsky. We should also say and, it's necessary yeah. to say that Newt Gingrich, not necessarily the guy you would imagine 
who is best suited to carry a message of you shouldn't lie about sex. Well, that's what happens. I mean, in the 98 midterms, which take place right before the vote, the Republicans do poorly. So they're already angry with him because he's not delivering the numbers he's promising on the Hill. But second, he's having an affair. And here's the leader of the party going after the president who's himself. And this wasn't the first. Uh, so he didn't embody at all the values that the party was espousing. And the party couldn't afford that anymore. In fact, the person who's first going to replace Newt Gingrich is Robert Livingston of Louisiana, who voluntarily steps down from this job before he gets it, because he's also in a relationship. And then, of course, the next speaker is Denny Hafter, uh, mm -hmm. whose, whose family values are anything but, as, as we know from his faith. Right. Yeah. The guy was a <laughs> pedophile uh, and was, yeah. was preying on, um, on, on, on wrestlers. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah, he was a coach. He was a wrestling coach. I don't know why, yeah, why that keeps coming up. And that also seems to be a Republican theme. Uh, Jim Jordan, at the very least, um, didn't necessarily participate, but certainly as a coach was not uh, protecting his players. That's according to the players. I don't know if we could believe them, but I, I would imagine that many of them wouldn't lie about it. But um, the, uh, so uh, Gingrich uh, goes down in flames, and then he just sort of maintains his grift for um, really through uh, the you know, the Trump, uh, the beginning of Trump, he seems to have, is he not around as much or am I just not watching as many right, as much right wing TV? He has a, he has a few years where he's not around as much. Uh, and he, he focuses on his consulting business and he makes a lot of money, but he does return. He returns first in that conservative world. He's a big presence on Fox television. He likes to present himself as the conservative intellectual um, and, and really takes on that role. But then he runs for president in 2012. And Kellyanne Conway actually helps run his campaign. Uh, and he starts the theme again of conservative populism. He goes after Mitt Romney for his work at Bain Capital, but he loses. And then he comes back a few years later as one of the vice presidential finalists for the Trump uh, ticket and ultimately loses out to Mike Pence. Um, so are we done with that era? I mean, do you think that like, I mean, Ging cause if it does feel like Gingrich's influence, I, I mean, in terms of the, let's put it this way, like the Republican party, I think is still on a G Gingrich trajectory, right. Where it's just like the, and I think you can see that both in terms of the elected officials, but you can see it with like the huge cadre of money that, that just flows into the right where it's, there are no principles. It's just about you know, winning on some effect and, and measured uh, either with clicks or views or book sales or, you know, uh, elections or uh, gerrymandering uh, or judges. Um, but it feels like the Democrats are exiting the Gingrich era before the Republicans are. Democrats definitely are. I think you see a, a true generational change that's happening in the party. Uh, and 2018 was the, the first time you really saw it play out in the electoral realm with Democrats who, in terms of their views, are just in a very different place than their predecessors. But many Democrats who've grown up watching this Gingrich Republican Party. And I think that's part of why they're very sensitive to the need to be a lot tougher and more sophisticated in competing with them. I don't know with Republicans. I mean, look, the, the person everyone's now talking about is the next uh, in line is Tucker Carlson. So that would suggest that the next generation might be just as committed to this one, uh, you know, for this form of politics. And I don't know. It's a shrinking party. It has a shrinking base. Uh, it has a president who's definitely not helping them expand it. But they still have things like the Electoral College. And I guess the question in 220, 224 is, uh, does this all finally come back to bite the party? And do we enter a new era? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but, but I think what you're touching on is the big question for the GOP. All right. Lastly, let me ask you this. It's not related to the book, but you're a historian. Um, and I know you're not supposed to do this. But how are historians going to look at this era? Like, like, I mean, it, it just, are there eras that you look back in, in American history or 
and just say, boy, those people, I mean, laughable must've been a nightmare being there, but they were, they were horrible. Like, I, where do you think we're going to fit in, in, in this, in that, in that, within that context, presuming of course, that we can, you know, save civilization uh, from global climate change. Yeah, look, I, I think the period leading into the Civil War certainly is just one study after another uh, of failed leadership, of dysfunctional politics, uh, and of the inability of, of elected officials to uh, resolve the biggest problem of our time, slavery. Uh, now, I think it's going to be an era of just total dysfunction and breakdown. And I think as a historian, it, it's not going to be that we're looking at both parties the same way. That just would be inaccurate. I think the, one of the big puzzles will be starting with Donald Trump and looking backwards and saying, how did we get to this place? How did we get to a moment where this is what you see from the presidency? And this is a party that is generally fine with that. And that's going to be one of the biggest questions, as well as the cost, the, the dysfunction that resulted from it, which we see playing out right now uh, in the pandemic. Well, I certainly hope they start with uh, Donald Trump, because if they start with Tom Cotton, we're in big, big trouble. <laughs> Uh, Julian Zalazer, the book is uh, Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of the Speaker, The Rise of the New Republican Party. We'll put a link at majority.fm. Thanks so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it as well. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Going to head into the fun half of the program. I will be joined by Nomiki Konst. In fact, She's joining us in just a moment. I can see the Matriarch Pack logo uh, ah, on her Zoom. It's not supposed to. <laughs> oh, maybe I forget that. Yeah, there we go. I signed in the wrong account. <laughs> but you still have the logo up there. Now I see your name, but it's yeah, also... Wait, still there still I am. There you go. Voila. Well, look at that. New, uh, new backdrop. I know, not as fancy. I don't know. I like that one. It is... Uh, mm-hmm. I, I like that. I like it. I should have, like, I saved all that money and just did it from my, my living room? No, I don't know. I mean, it cuts both ways. You do need some sound deadening in there, but we can talk about that later. And, okay. Uh, I have uh, to move my microphone over. No, you're good. You're good. Okay. Um, well, I should remind people, uh, this program relies on your support. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Oh, and we should also, you know what, let's play this clip as a way of, uh, of reminding people about our merch shop. Um, this is fascinating. You know, we have, uh, uh, Nomi, as you know, we have a, uh, a merch shop at shop.majorityreportradio.com. And um, we have different merchandise there. We have a new shirt, a limited edition shirt that we've laid out. Uh, but wait a second. Let's play this clip. Have you seen this clip? Because um, this reminded me a little bit of, of what we're trying to do. They apparently have taken a mummy oh my God. and they have been able to put it through an MRI to get a notion of what the, the sound box sounded like. And so check this out. This is really crazy. Scientists were able to mimic Nessie Amun's voice by recreating his mouth and vocal cords with a 3D printer. It allowed them to produce a single sound. I'm losing it, bro. <laughs> It's the I'm losing it, bro. Uh, sounds almost identical. Wait, no, not to that. Uh, to uh, I'm losing it, bro. It sounds almost identical to uh, John Benjamin's um, uh, sound drop that we used as the basis of a shirt. All proceeds go uh, to uh, skidrow.org, Skid Row Trust in uh, L.A. to help with uh, unhoused folks. And um, it's just, I, I'm, I'm blown away by the coincidence. A lot of people are, are claiming that we stole it from uh, that. Uh, the that mummy? The mummy, <laughs> but uh, can, I can assure you that is not the case. Um, but people can go and uh, buy all sorts of stuff at our, our merch shop. And of course, sign up for the AM Quickie. And don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. Uh, tonight is Tuesday night. The Michael Brooks Show happens every Tuesday night. You can check it out at patreon.com slash TMBS or youtube.com slash TMBS. Who's on tonight, Matt? Tonight, 
Uh, we have Robert McCh McChesney on corporate monopolies and, and media present and history. Yeah, McChesney is uh, a professor, I believe, at University of Madison. Uh, excuse me, University of Wisconsin, Madison, uh, who's been writing about uh, this stuff for a long time. Great guest. Uh, so check that out. And uh, Nomi, what's happening on your show? Um, I have Kate Bricolet from The Daily Beast talking about Jelaine Maxwell. She's been following her case for, you know, I don't know, last year or so. And uh, Matt Stoller is debunking the myths of Hamilton and how we all pretend to love him, but he's really a horrible. He Hamilton. So do I. <laughs> I mean, I, for me, it's just like I, my kids sing it all the time. I've never seen it, but um, I have. Yeah. my kids. Well, uh, there's a story. I don't want to give it all away, but the, 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 the basis of why it's being mythologized, a lot of it actually has roots in New York politics. Um, Lin-Manuel Miranda's father is a very powerful a uh, political consultant here in New York who represents the the bondholders in Puerto Rico uh, and helps get uh, Tom Perez elected as chair of the DNC. So all things are connected. Wow, and that's and I know that Stoller's got a real problem with the 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 finances the the financier uh, bent of of Hamilton. Um, that's interesting. When's that going up, and where can people that, find it? The full show went up on uh, yesterday on Monday on YouTube uh, slash the Nomi Key Show. And it'll be released in chunks. Um, it's also on patreon.com slash the Nomi Kiso. We also have swag. Ha ha. Oh, I didn't realize that. Three things. Stickers, mugs, out. and totes. How did you do that so quick? I thought you had to wait know. 10 years before you had merch. <laughs> I'm a hustler, uh, Sam. I'm a hustler. I know. I, it takes, I'm <laughs> very, very slow. Matt, what's happening on... Um, oh, well, also, folks, don't forget to check out the Antifada. Find that at patreon.com slash the Antifada. And I think um, this is the week that Jamie's going to be on the, uh, the Socialist Conference. Uh, more info, check out the blog for that. Matt, what's happening on Literary Hangover? Uh, Twitch.tv slash Literary Hangover. I'll probably be streaming tomorrow night. All right. Well, oh, that sounds okay. <laughs> Not really. That's soft sell. All right. We're going to take a quick break. Head into the fun half, 646-257-3920. You can also IM the show with the use of our app at majorityapp.com back in a second. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Rand Paul. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jabber. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. 
Nazi. That guy might be a Nazi. Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way. Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up. Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Uh, fun half of the program. I am uh, just trying to get some uh, numbers on Florida. It's not going well down there. As you know, uh, know me, uh, Florida is one of the hot spots. It is uh, taken off. You, of course, uh, vacated another uh, hot spot. I mean, the curve that's happening in uh, this country is um, it's bad. It is like starting to like, you know, we were like this in terms of the whole country. I mean, New York, of course, was like this. And there's some... Uh, some parts of New York that are starting to grow a little bit mm-hmm. on Island, um, upstate a little bit, people are getting a little bit too cocky, but we were going like this. I mean, like this as a country and then we're like this. Right. Um, and it's a problem and people are starting to notice. You remember, uh, Ron DeSantis about uh, a month or two ago was bragging about how he oh could get God. it done. He was sitting there with Mike Pence. Mike Pence was looking lovingly over at him and, so proud, so proud about how DeSantis was not taking, was not, was not going to um, sink into like this, this um, defensive crouch where you have to take this uh, pandemic seriously. Uh, well, here is Ron DeSantis uh, trying to give a, a press conference in uh, Florida, and um, protester decides um, to state the obvious. Maybe a couple, but it was obviously much different than what we're uh, than what we're finding here. So I think the. Um, so I think. So at that time, when we had the. Um, when we were here, we had a whole bunch of concerns about what would end up happening in the next few weeks and, and months. We had concerns about. There you go. He talks right through it. But that stuff, that stuff actually like. That gets people that gets I mean, that's going to hurt DeSantis. I, I, you know, the value of that. Well, I think you're muted. Are you muted? Uh, I am. I was muted. <laughs> The value of that, I think, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I suppose you could overstate it, but I think that the, the, the value of that is going to be is pretty big because there's a lot of people, I imagine, in Florida going like, how did we get here? Right. In this short period of time. And and you have to keep in mind, it's like while you have northern Florida and and the lawlessness of, of the conservative, you know, the panhandle in, in middle of Florida, southern Florida, obviously, you know, more more democratic. But there's so many elderly in Florida, just as there were in, in Arizona you know, in these Rust Belt states, these Sun Belt states, where it just affects those communities, like Seattle, when Seattle blew up with their, their nursing home, that's that's not going to bear well. I mean, the numbers in New York with the nursing homes, that's where it's hitting even Democratic, you know, Governor Cuomo hard, is when you look at those nursing home rates, you're, you're killing the elderly, and it angers people, the conservatives even. Yep, and, um, I, you know, the... Polling has Donald Trump uh, in trouble in Florida, and I imagine that is like a, a largely a a an anger as to, you know, the sort of the the mess that Florida has turned into in in this regard. And I don't know how you reverse it, uh, frankly, at least in the short term. It's going to take a long time. Um, but it's good that 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 people are starting to challenge uh, these guys. Yeah. And uh, that the message is sort of breaking through that they because they need this pressure. And, and and look, at the end of the day, a big part of this is a function of uh, these states 
relying so heavily on sales tax to do anything. Right. Um, and, you know, there's no income tax in Florida. Right. And they rely on the sales tax so much. Uh, tourism such a big issue for them. And uh, really, this is where the federal government needs to step in and say, yeah, you, the way that you have designed your um, your sources of revenue don't work in this situation. Here's a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. But instead, no, we're not getting that. Well, and then that's where you're going to see DeSantis, because there's gonna, there's got to be some point where, where Trump is going to push some sort of, I mean, he's already like inching, warming up to the warm, to the, to the mask, like mask ordinance. I don't know, publicly calling for whatever it is, or at least, you know, don't dine inside. I mean, a lot of these, these restaurants in the South are, you can dine inside and outside, whereas in New York, it's all outside, which makes a huge difference, right? Yep. So he's going to be putting pressure on them and you're going to see the Republican governors and the federal government, aka Trump, at odds with each other. I just, I see it happening in the next few months. And the real question to my, in my mind is, is, is Donald Trump going to, I mean, uh, you know, at one point, what, what I can't understand is why Trump isn't out there. And they're, they're saying they're starting to ease off this notion of, of federal insurance, uh, you know, unemployment extension. Right. But I don't know why Trump is not out there going like, we're going to give, I don't know, Fifty billion dollars to Florida, right? I mean, like we remember, like that trick that George Bush did uh, in, in the run-up. I think it was to 04 election was to declare an emergency, um, a state of emergency for the state of Florida because uh, I can't remember what hurricane it was, yeah. but they were very quick to pull that trigger. Yep. You know, let the, uh, I would imagine Donald Trump would be, you know, putting, you know, pouring money out the door, and I, I don't, I don't understand what the even like the what the theory is behind this. Maybe uh, he's waiting know, for hurricane season. Maybe. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm frankly, I'm surprised. Um, meanwhile, Brian Kilmeade has the same question I do, which is surprising. As you know, I'm Brian not Kilmeade, surprised now. <laughs> well, Brian Kilmeade, I mean, first off, earlier we played a clip of him talking about like, why can't we, why can't we send our kids to school? They're doing it in Denmark. They're doing it in Norway. They're doing it in Belgium. They're doing it in Switzerland, Greece, and Germany. They can reopen their schools. Why can't we? And then later in the program, he answers his own question because this federal government can't do anything correctly. <laughs> Clip number two. I would say this. Uh, for the administration, he should just focus, uh, everybody should just focus on getting testing, getting it quick. Right now, there's a huge testing issue and there's backlog in PPE. What he can do, what the president can do and his administration can do is make sure those aren't an issue. I mean, it's been four or five months. It should not be an issue. I know on Long Island, one of the uh, kids on my daughter's soccer team tested positive. They all, spirit, they all had to go down and get tested four or five days still to get a result in four or five days, five to six to seven days, even on the, on the, on the quick test or three days. That shouldn't be the case anymore. Meanwhile. Yeah. Oh not only should it not be the case anymore, uh, Quest Diagnostics, one of the biggest testing facilities in the country, is, has put out a uh, press release uh, yesterday, 4.30 p.m., and they basically are talking uh, that they are, uh, they can't, add capacity their turnaround now is their average turnaround average turnaround time is seven days yep. or more yep my cousin got tested uh in arizona over 14 days ago and he still hasn't received his results he's like i'm fine he came in contact with somebody who ended up testing positive for covid and so you know, he got tested. He was very responsible about it. And he still has not received his results two weeks later. That's nuts. This is That's insane. Nuts. In Arizona, they're like, well, we don't have way. the capacity. What do you mean? It, it, it can't work this way. Nope. It cannot work this way. I mean, to, to the extent that we're not going to be able to open up schools, mm -hmm. this is why. Because if right. you can't determine, I mean, they should be testing. They should be do, We should be at a point four months into this. And the re uh, where you're able to test random populations, you know, every other day with a 24 hour turnaround, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they'll have to move to group testing. Um, but 
and it should be saliva based and yeah. it should be i mean the we we should be so far ahead but it, the the reason why we're not is because there is no financial incentive for quest to increase its capacity there is no financial incentive for any of these facilities to increase their capacity and be stuck with these costs uh, that they don't think that they're going to recoup long term. And so the bottom line is this is where the federal government's got to come in and pour money into it, pour money into it. And they should have done this four months ago and they're still not doing it. And we're all going to be effed because of it. Mm -hmm. How I mean, if, if, if they're the same tasks that are being produced or maybe I think there's a few different versions, right? Have you read anything about how other countries, uh, I mean, with semi-private health systems, whether it's, uh, I mean, really any country in the, Euro in the European Union, how they were able to, to expand testing so rapidly? Well, they, they, they poured money into it from the beginning. From the beginning, they did, straight from up. From the beginning, from the beginning, they did. And we, we refused to accept the test that they developed. So we well, I remember that, of course. A month behind yeah. anyways, but there's just no federal support for it. They don't even have, they got rid of the guy who's the, uh, yeah. the, the testings are. Yeah. There's, there's no, the, the reason why we can't do it is because there's no will. There's been no desire to do it. And, you know, we don't need a single payer healthcare system to do this. Um, we can do this on an emergency basis mm -hmm. by federal government spending the money and sinking it into a facility to do it. But they are so wedded to a, an ideology that says the federal government uh, shouldn't be in this business that they won't do it. And they're screwing everybody about it. Here's Donald Trump uh, being asked a question about the anxiety that people have about school reopening. This question was asked in, in, in shortly after it, California announced uh, that San Diego and L.A. school systems, the two of the biggest in the country uh, will not be reopening at least in September. And um, here's Donald Trump. I don't, like, I don't know how they thought all this stuff would just take care of itself, but that's, they're still going with that one. Yes, Mr. President, uh, Los Angeles just announced that they are delaying the opening of their schools. New York already said they were going to delay them. Other school districts are giving parents the choice whether to send their kids to school or not. What do you tell parents who look at this, who look at Arizona where a school teacher recently died teaching summer school, parents who are worried about uh, the safety of their children in public yeah, schools? The schools should be opened. Schools should be opened. If these kids want to go to school. You're losing a lot of lives by keeping things closed. We did the right thing. We saved millions of lives. We saved millions of lives when we did the initial closure. Had we not done what we did, we would have had Two to Mike and I were talking about it before two to three million lives lost, uh, but we did that. So we're at about 135,000, and we'll be at somewhat higher than that by the time it it ends. Uh, and again, the vaccines are happening and the therapeutics are happening, but I'm not even talking about that. So we'll be at a somewhat higher. But we would have lost two million, three million lives had we not done it. Uh, now we understand it also. We understand there are certain vulnerabilities, young children. Yeah. Um. What is their incentive? I cannot wrap my head around it. Like, if you're going to look at Betsy DeVos's scheme to privatize schools, I look at Puerto Rico where most of the schools were shut down. They forced them to shut down. They closed all these schools. I just don't understand what the incentive is here. What they're... What, what they're what, what they're banking on? I mean, I don't know. I, I, Donald Trump, I don't, from an electoral standpoint, I don't understand how they're operating. From a, and, and maybe to a certain extent, there are other forces that are basically, you know, giving him policy advice that, because look, the more you destroy all of this infrastructure, right? And yeah. that's what we're doing. I mean, we're, we're undercutting the, the public school systems here. We're undercutting all of government functions. The more you do that, all you're left with is the power of money. And that power against a weakened uh, governmental infrastructure and one that has diminished support from uh, its citizenry, because why mm -hmm. wouldn't you? Right. I mean, it's you can't necessarily make the distinction like it's it's hard for you to say, oh, the reason why my state um, you know, or city 
has cut uh, jobs and uh, diminished services is because the federal government's not stepping up. And the reason why the federal government's not stepping up is because Donald Trump and uh, the White House and the Republic. I mean, that's, you know, most people don't necessarily um, have the time or spend the time to think about it uh, in those terms. And so as you uh, destroy the infrastructure and the support for government, all you're left is, is the power of money at that point. I mean, there's there's so many of these like, like local governments, I mean, and, and, you know, for the most part, I, they fund the, the public schools. They are stepping up and saying, with exception to like Orange County and some conservative, but like Los Angeles, San Diego, they've stepped up and said, we are closing our schools down. There's no financial, I, I don't, I mean, that's actually rewarding the local government because they don't have to pay, the, uh, they still have to pay property. There's still, there's still other payments, but it's, it's, it's actually reducing their budget. I just don't understand what the mindset is. You're just going to have teachers organizing protests around the country saying they refuse to show up to work because they don't want to endanger their but communities. That weakens, but that weakens uh, teachers, uh, teacher unions, doesn't it? I mean, creating this dynamic where even if it's 30 percent of, uh, of, of parents want to send their kids back to school, and they're blaming the teachers because the teachers just don't want to get sick. You know, uh, that dynamic undercuts teachers unions. But how many and, people are, I mean, really, you think, is, is it 30 percent of parents want to send their kids back to school? I, I mean, I, I would imagine there's a lot more, I mean, but uh, that want to send their kids back to school. But then, they're, you know, I mean, people are, are afraid to. But I think there's at least I mean, I'm looking at the, the data and the, the, there's at least 30 percent who are like, I'm definitely I want my kids back in school, period. End of story. Without any other sort of like qualifications, <laughs> they don't want their kids. Is what they... they, they're like. In other words, they're not <laughs> afraid. Right. Let's put it this way: they're not afraid to put their kids back into school. Right. I mean, I would like my kids back into school. I'm afraid to do it. I'm not sure yeah. where I'm going to fall on this. You know, if it's open in September, I don't know if I'll send my kids right. uh, back to school. I mean, I, 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 I'm almost, I'm almost adamant about not sending my uh, high schooler back. The risk is less for younger kids. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure about that one, but I, 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 I don't. I think it's highly unlikely I'm going to send my high schooler back to school. So I don't blame uh, you. We'll see, Milo. If you're listening, we'll talk about it later. Sorry for <laughs> you to hear about it this way. Um, let's go. That's how Sam a- breaks his news to his exactly. family, guys. Exactly. Got some bad news for you. <laughs> Call him from a 718 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, is this me? Yeah, it is. Who's this? Hi, uh, my name is John. I'm from uh, New York. Uh, so, first time, long time. Thanks for everything you do. Uh, I just wanted to call. Um, I want to talk about it's a little bit off topic, but maybe not. Um, Stephen J. Gould, the scientist. Um, I, well, I'm thinking about it because uh, I actually saw one of your guys' old clips uh, regarding Sam Harris and you know, all, all that. Um, and Michael mentioned it and uh, mentioned The Mismeasure of Man, the book, um, and uh, I wanted, wanted to look into it and stuff like that. He kind of made a joke uh, that it's kind of a pothead, you know, pothead uh, college kid saying a uh, uh, cool cool book uh read the mismeasure of man bro and i guess that's me but uh it looks really interesting uh but i I just wanted to mention that it seems to me that uh science is inherently and the way we talk about science is inherently political and uh i think he spoke a lot about that which is old theory of evolution too and the mismeasure and uh the race science stuff so i think uh we need to be cognizant of that and i think he's an important source to look into it i just wanted to mention that uh and uh yeah that's about it all right appreciate the phone call uh miss measure of man is an all-time great book folks get it six calling from a six seven eight who's this where are you calling from hey is that me yeah it is you hey this is uh ian calling from atlanta uh thanks for calling taking my call thanks for calling what's uh, on your mind i was wanting to talk about uh mask and this debate about whether or not people should be wearing masks when they go out. I just wanted to say that it actually is an issue of uh, violating rights. And the right that's being violated is property rights because the business owner has a right to set their policies inside of their business. 
you don't have a right to come in there and violate their policies. Such as when you go to a movie theater, you can't just talk loud. You can get kicked out for talking loud, even though talking loud isn't illegal. Or if you go to a swimming pool, you can't get, you can't just run around the pool. You can get thrown out for that because that's dangerous, even though running's not illegal. And I'm just wondering why it's been so hard for people to make that connection or to make that case when people bring up this debate. There's, there is multiple arguments that you could make along those lines. A, you could say, look, private businesses have the ability to discriminate against their clientele as long as it's not based upon certain protected uh, classes, right? Uh, no shirt, no shoes, no service. And in there are also um, there are there are also health department. Um, you know, you get you, your 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 restaurant can be shut down if the health department finds things that are endangering um, uh, customers, and that is also you know the idea, the concept of 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 this is just it's just absurd. And the only thing I can tell you is that must have been about seven eight years ago. Uh, I interviewed I think it was Haley. Uh, I can't remember her last name. It's it's just just popped out of my head. But she uh, she had written a piece about the use of the First Amendment as a way of rolling back a lot of OSHA regulations. Hmm. Like you're you're infringing hmm. upon my business's First Amendment rights to force me to tell my my uh, employees to wash their hands or something. Wow. Um, that type of stuff. I mean, that's just a like a sort of a a blunt uh, example. But yeah, it's absurd. It's absurd from a property rights standpoint. But also, you know, look, you have a health crisis, and there's authority, right. and 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 in the same way that the First Amendment can be abridged in situations where it is a danger to society, like you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. This is the oldest example there is, uh, or the most, I guess, uh, you know, uh, uh, broadly understood example there is. Um, there is authority for local, state, federal uh, officials to say, we have a health crisis. This is what you need. The The other part, there's like another part of this. It's just that like people don't appreciate the science. I appreciate the call, but it's, it reminds me of this clip. Let's play this clip right here. This is Tucker Carlson. You, um, in between um, not apologizing for his um, former incel <laughs> racist head writer, Last night, uh, Tucker Carlson uh, was dropping this little nugget into his um, spew last night. Check this out. This is what happens when science intersects with politics. Both lose, and the country loses most of all. Keeping kids out of school, keeping the elderly inside, forcing everyone to wear a mask when there's no evidence that helps. All of what? these become statements of resistance and moral imperatives. You're seeing it happen in the state of California on a wide scale. Okay, so what he's saying is that when you do, when you just have a mask because you politically want to, like first off, let's, rec let's remember that Donald Trump is the president of the United States. He wore a mask. Why did he wear a mask? Because he doesn't, because he, because he doesn't want the peer pressure. I mean, he wore a mask because his own government, all the experts say you should wear masks. But where else could we find? Brendan, can you help me? Can we find something for Tucker Carlson maybe to read while he's on his uh, long planned vacation uh, to read about the efficacy of masks? Let's see. A Wearing a mask process. cuts own risk of novel coronavirus by 65%, experts say. A range of new research now suggests that Max also protect the wearer. It takes for granted that it protects other people. And this is published five days ago. But what, what is this left-wing uh, site that it's on? <laughs> oh, it's on Fox News. Huh. Well, wh wh Maybe somebody could send that link to Tucker Carlson. But the opening line, this is what happens when science interferes with politics. I thought we said that about, like, religion. Now yeah. it's like science is a political thing? The, there is a long-standing um, right-wing 
agenda to attack science. Gertrude right. Himmelfarb, Bill Crystal's mom, talked about this decades ago. Uh, it even made it into FUBAR, uh, the book mm. Stephen Sherrill and I wrote 15 years ago. The, uh, the attack on science is part and parcel of making sure that there is no objective truth that exists. Mm -hmm. And even no objective truth that is dynamic, like science is, mm -hmm. that exists. Therefore, it's all bets are off. You got your facts, I got mine, period, end of story. There's no experts. George Bush was a complete exercise in uh, anti-intellectualism yep. and, and the diminishment of, of expertise in these areas. Because you can't trust the science if it's coming from, from CNN or the New York Times. I mean, they, they're biased. And so they're, they're pulling the science that they like. Exactly. Well, the, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the larger uh, story is you can't trust science. <laughs> um, here is Donald Trump. I mean, here's uh, Tucker Carlson since we're on, uh, um, on this uh, Tucker Carlson uh, kick right now. So uh, I don't know if you start, heard this story of a guy named Blake Neff, mm -hmm. who is, um, was Tucker Carlson's um, top writer since 2016, apparently. Four years. That's a long time to be top writer. He had bragged in the Dartmouth, um, I think, uh, newspaper or alumni magazine that um, the first draft of everything uh, Tucker says is his. Um, and, well, it turns out that an anonymous tipster let CNN know that this guy Blake Neff has been posting for years and years and years on a uh, right-wing site all sorts of heinous things about women heinous things about black people uh, he has been bragging about how he'll put uh, what do they call those uh, Easter eggs on the show so he'll do like little comments that come from this forum and they'll he'll write it into scripts to impress all his buddies. Now, I want you to listen. This came out on Friday. Tucker Carlson didn't address it on Friday. He comes back to work on Monday. Now, know me, you work in cable news. Mm -hmm. I work cable news occasionally, do a little hits. You ever heard of anybody starting their vacation on a Tuesday? <laughs> All right, but uh, here is Tucker Carlson. He came back over the weekend, Monday night, to issue a, I don't know what you would call this, about Blake Neff, his head writer, who uh, quit or was fired on Saturday by Fox News. Uh, and this is what he said. Over the weekend, you may have seen stories about a writer on this show called Blake Neff. For years, since he was in college, Blake posted anonymously on an internet message board for law school students. On Pause Friday, it. many of those posts... Pause it. Pause it. Now, he said for years, uh, as a college student, he posted on this board, uh, a board that is known for, um, for right-wing uh, law school students. Now, he's been writing for Tucker for four years, so that would make you believe that He's neither a law school student or a college student anymore. Right. He must not be writing this. This must be stuff from way in his past. And this is a story of cancel culture. Right. No, he wrote this stuff like two weeks ago. Right. And he, did, and he didn't say right wing. He said law school. So it was like to make it seem very, you know. Yes. Uh, yes. B pull it back a little bit, Brendan. Let's, let's, let's hear this. Because I just want to go through how this guy completely prevaricates throughout this entire thing. Law school locker room talk. Love for years <laughs> since he was in college, Blake posted anonymously on an internet message board for law school students. On Friday, many of those posts became public. Blake was horrified by the story and he was ashamed. Friday afternoon, he Pause resigned it. from his job. Pause it. He was horrified by the story and he was ashamed by the story. What's the story, though? He seems to have left that out. What did I, Blake what, say? Look, look at the story. Yeah. He's ashamed by the story. We don't know what, well, I'm sure uh, Tucker will tell us what he uh, wrote about and what the story was. It's the story that he's ashamed of. Horrified by the story and he was ashamed. Friday afternoon, he resigned from his job. We want to say a couple of things about this. 
First, what Blake wrote anonymously was wrong. We don't endorse those words. They have no connection to the show. It is wrong to attack people. Hmm. First off, they very well do. I mean, he would put Easter eggs in the script of the shows and then come brag about it. So it did in that respect. Now, we also know that if you're a head writer of a political uh, talk show for four years, none of your political beliefs seep into what you write, of course. Of Everybody not. knows that, right? That, that's impossible to happen. All right, go back a little bit because he's, he's talking about like, he's, we're, we're ashamed. We don't, we don't endorse those words, whatever those words were. Yes. First, what Blake wrote anonymously was wrong. We don't endorse those words. They have no connection to the show. It is wrong to attack people for qualities they cannot control. In this country, we judge people for what they do, not for how they oh, were born. Pause we it. often pause say- Pause it for one second. What is now, this reinvention? <laughs> yeah, this is fascinating because the stuff he wrote- Anonymous though, what? Yeah, it was it was it was anonymous. He was writing them well, not anonymous as a a, a name. Yeah. People knew who the guy was, uh, but he wrote stuff like, um, let's see, uh, the um, oh stuff like um, you know, uh, black people are lazy or they're all in, and so like, I I, I can't tell if what Tucker's saying is like. If people are lazy, you can't, it's not a nice for that to change, you know, to, I mean, like, he's not addressing it at all. In fact, he's simply saying it's rude to point out uh, that people are lazy. Not that, hey, he's uh, dealing in these racist tropes. Never mind, apparently, this guy was also like attacking a woman in particular on this board and basically doxing her or something to that effect. It's unclear. Right. Uh, but, Continue. Young man, the young man has message board Tourette syndrome. You can't help it. <laughs> that, because we mean it. We'll continue to defend that principle, often alone among national news programs, because it is essential. Nothing is more important. Blake fell short of that standard, and he has paid a very heavy price for it. But we should also point out to the ghouls now beating their chests in triumph at the destruction of a young man, that self-righteousness oh. also has its costs. We are all human. When we pretend we are holy, we are lying. When we pose as blameless in order to hurt other people, we are committing the gravest sin of all, and we will be punished for it. There's no question. Okay. Now, God. Um, oh my God. are you really a holy person if you are not harassing women on a uh, incel board? Are you really a holy person if you're not posting racist stuff on this board? Is that all it takes to be holy in this in this day and age? Well, I mean, it's, it's that you're holding you're not holy if you're holding bad actors accountable for their bad actions. That's what it is. Us talking about how that is a bad action and he should be held accountable. We are unholy as a result because it's the, God's job to do that. The whole problem is the story. He's attacking the writers of the story and completely distancing because he goes on every time he, the guy talks about um, the show. It's all we, 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 we. And it's all as if it's like, you know, Blake Neff guy. Which I, I, he was he had a job somewhere that was somewhat not affiliated with the, the show and uh, he's been fired. Uh, but this is guy who was like one of his top writers. And then he goes on to say this. This is what he says here. Um, uh yeah, do the um, do the uh, uh, oh, oh, yeah, here's his oh, oh, this is Tucker. You know, let's play this. This is Tucker from 2018. He's never, ever, ever met a white supremacist. Can you probably imagine that? And he's reading from a monologue, probably the first draft, if we're to believe Blake Neff, written by Blake Neff. Virginia, in which a woman was fatally struck by a car that was driven into the crowd. If you followed the hyperventilating press coverage leading up to yesterday's event, you probably expected to see thousands of hooded Klansmen showing up on horseback in D.C. to commemorate and celebrate the killing. White supremacy is just that prevalent in America, they tell us. It's everywhere, except it's not. That's a lie. White supremacy is not ubiquitous in America. It's not a crisis. It's not even a meaningful category. It is incredibly rare. You could easily live your entire life in this country without meeting a single person who believes anything like that. Most of us have lived lives like that. I have. 
In fact, this is a generous, tolerant country. It always has been that. People who tell you otherwise are either delusional or trying to control you with fear, likely both. In the end yesterday, just a couple of dozen people showed up out of a country of 320 million people. They milled around for a while, got yelled at, and left. So much for the Klan rally. What is a crisis in America, and a growing crisis, is left-wing extremism and violence. Our elites abet and encourage it. Our media pretend it doesn't exist. Here, There you go. Uh, well, it turns out that um, Tucker knew at least one white supremacist. And he was actually the guy who was probably writing those very words. Well, okay, if, if there's no white supremacy, why is he spending an entire segment talking about it and caring so much about it? And then also, if the leftists are the bad people, then what are the white supremacists that he's defending? This is what I'm not like. They don't it, exist. He doesn't have to defend them because they don't exist. There's only one of them. And he just happened to write right. for the show. <laughs> Here is Tucker announcing his long planned Tuesday starting vacation, which is a really odd time to start your vacation um, in cable news or really in anywhere other than unless you're like got a store that sells like. I don't know, Monday morning quarterbacking. <laughs> well, we're out of time. I'm gonna spend the next four days trout fishing. Ugh. Long planned. This is one of those years where okay. if you don't get it in now, you're probably not going to. If something dramatic happens, of course, we'll be back. We've got some tape segments for you. Brian Kilmeade will be. Oh yeah. my God. Trout mm. fishing. If you don't get it in now, for, wait, but what's interesting is four days. Okay, so the days of the week he's deciding to take off rather than weekend, four days. Usually if you take off four days, it's a four-day weekend or... Well, no, the idea, is, the idea is that he's trying to justify, you know, like, oh, I've always planned a four-day vacation. Mm -hmm. I, don't want the, I don't want those extra three days to be contiguous. I want to come back from the weekend, do a day of work, that just coincidentally I have to apologize or not apologize for the white supremacist who's been writing my monologues for the past four years. But white supremacists and, don't exist. And by apologize, I mean, I'm sorry you found out mm. that he is a, um, a white supremacist. And in fact, those people who told you are horrible human beings and they're going to be punished by God, maybe. Um, and then I'm going to go on a vacation because that's the classic, what a coincidence situation. Um, maybe he's also going to try and find another writer. I wonder if he goes onto that board and tries <laughs> to find another writer. Yeah, they, think... they have a uh, listings uh, article there. Hey guys, I'm sorry. This, on. <laughs> this this thread on this uh, incel uh, white supremacist board is exclusively for job openings on Tucker's show. Oh my god! Let's go to the phones. Call him from a. 308 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 308? Hey, it's, yeah, it's, it's Kowalski. Kowals First time listener, long time caller. Kowalski in Nebraska. What's on your mind, Kowalski? Oh, that's a dangerous question. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, for the holidays, I had a very, really, really good experience. Uh, some friends of mine went tubing down the river, and I lost my phone within the first four minutes. Ooh. Sorry. It was that. the most peaceful experience of my life for the last, like, five years. Oh, well. I did not have a phone for, like, three days. <laughs> it was amazing. Okay, I'm, I'm jealous. Yeah, so, um, a uh, question I was going to ask you guys was directed towards Matt in particular. Okay. All right. Is he a Halo um, Reach or a Halo 3 guy? That that would explain a lot about him. Well, I'm honestly more of a Half-Life guy. Halo is a bit too much of a social game. I like to play single player. Halo is kind of all online. So Halo 2 is really is the most I got invested in. All right. That that was a very safe question. Um, I was just curious. What are your guys' thoughts on like the uh, video game industry? continuously monopolizing and like do you think there's going to be any way for like video game 
co-ops to come about? Have you guys heard anything along those lines? I've done some research online, but I feel like this is a topic a lot of people don't talk about, especially during the pandemic. I think a lot of people have realized the good social connection you can get from online gaming. Like a bunch of my friends and stuff, we all keep together just by like playing Call of Duty or something like that on the, you know, end of the day or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I just it didn't, didn't know if you guys have heard anything in particular on it. It didn't work for Kurt Schilling, um, but I will say my dream, uh, my dream job is to be a sort of Cliff Blazensky, who is the Gears of War lead developer, uh, where you, I can just create like a sort of communist left wing socialist gaming platform that would, and just have game ideas for games all the time. But I don't know about the. I, if we have any video game developers listening, maybe. I think you need such a big scale for those projects that I feel like it's hard to, you can't like do a Patreon to fund it basically. All right, good uh, good call Kowalski. Maybe more for literary hangover Twitch TV, but. Uh, <laughs> I had a pre- lot of opinions, Sam. I just, I've been waiting to share them. <laughs> Nomi, Nomi's like a chock full of the, the uh, gaming monopoly, but it is an interesting question. But uh, I, I think the amount late. of money that they, in the, the lead time just seems massive. There Appreciate are some the co-ops, but. All right, see ya. Bye. Uh, let's go back to the phones. Call from a 210 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Good afternoon, Sam. This is John from San Antonio. John from San Antonio. How are you, John? Oh, I'm good, good. How's the phone sounding? Sounds great. Okay, I hope you enjoyed your vacation. Uh, It's good to have you back. So uh, today there are runoff uh, elections in Texas in the 10th District where Mike Siegel is endorsed by Bernie Sanders, a brand new Congress in our revolution, and many environmental and union organizations is running against Pratish Gandhi, who has raised $1.2 million dollars yet lost to Siegel by 11 points in the original primary. Cult of Trump party uh, Michael McCall only beat Siegel by 4.3 in the 2018 election after winning by 19 points in 2016. This district is gerrymandered to help uh, Republicans win, but it also covers North Austin, which has a surge of new residents who have been voting at uh, very high percentages in the, the last couple cycles. So uh, it also covers a rural area between Austin uh, and the Houston suburbs. So Beto O'Rourke actually won this district by .2 in his two, in 2018 run for the Senate. So Siegel could join a list of progressives who are competitive in swing districts along with Cara Eastman, Dana Balter, John uh, Hoadley, uh, who could flip a district and come in competitive swing districts. And the 31st district of, of Texas, Donna Amon, who supports Medicare for All and a Green New Deal, is running against Christine Mann in the primary in March. Amon received 31% of the vote compared to Mann's 34. This district encompasses the northern suburbs of Austin. Uh, you see a similar pattern as the 10th district. Uh, Republican John Carter won this race in 2016 by 22 points. And in 2018, Carter won by less than three points. Over the years, we've talked about how vote totals uh, don't necessarily, in in primaries, don't necessarily apply to votes in the general election, but it does correlate uh, in at least about 80% of the votes. In 2018, there are only three seats uh, out of the 36 uh, House seats that didn't uh, didn't uh, coordinate with the, the original vote totals in the primaries, and those are the two seats the Democrats flipped in the 7th and the 32nd district, and in the 23rd district, where Democrats only lost by 0.5%. So in this year's primaries, uh, Democrats' vote totals uh, were higher in seven districts, the 3rd, the 10th, the 21st, 23rd, 24th, 25th, and 31st. I understand that people are going to say, well, of course, you had a competitive presidential race. More people showed up than Republicans were, you know, everybody knew Trump was going to win. But, I mean, I think uh, a lot of people, you know, expect great things. And uh, I think Rachel Bittacoffer is one of those. She uh, said that basically out of those seven seats, four of them will flip to Democrats uh, along with the 22nd district. Wow. And, and three more, including uh, 
uh, our, our toss-ups. So, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, seats flipping in the in the uh, in Texas. You know, in the House, and I uh, hope uh, I encourage everybody to vote for uh, Mike Siegel and in Donna Amon, and also uh, in Maine, uh, brand new Congress, Our Revolution endorsed the. Uh, Betsy Sweet is running for the Senate against Sarah Gideon. Uh, it's definitely a long shot, but you can voice your opinion. You know, uh, you know, Betsy Sweet is a great candidate. Supports all the same issues. You know, left candidate, uh, you know, Medicare for all, Green New Deal. I mean, all the all the you know the the left uh, issues that, that she supports. She's a really good candidate, and so I hope she can get you know a decent amount of votes. I just want to, I don't know if you remember a call that we had on uh, January 17th of this year. It was right after the uh, the kind of the Warren fiasco where she attacked Bernie. And I said that she was doing that because because uh, I felt that this was a play for, she, she's doing this because she wants to be Biden's VP. VP. Right. We're extremely skeptical of that opinion at the time i am i'll tell and, you if if that was what she was doing it for it was the dumbest thing possible she could do the the single the single most valuable thing that elizabeth warren could have done to become a joe biden's vice presidential nominee i mean it it, it was it's actually it was such such an obvious thing to do uh would have been to endorse Bernie Sanders absolutely after Super Tuesday, had she done left. that, had yeah. she done that, she would have a like it would have enhanced her opportunity if if Bernie Sanders had won to become his VP, mm-hmm. and B, she would be able to now go to Biden and credibly say, I can deliver yep. everything you want from Bernie Sanders. I can deliver. Now I don't know if she actually could or would whatever. But that's what she could say. It was the single stupidest thing in the world for her to do. I think the reason why she did what she did uh, with Bernie Sanders was an attempt to win. Yeah. I, and that's what was – that was so crazy about it. The writing was on the wall at that point. I mean, just the mathematics were so clear she had nowhere to move. It's it, it, it's mind-boggling. And then her team doubled down. I mean, we a lot of us have tried to mend – and, and I think, you know, would be great to have her as VP. I just, at this point, given that there's no progressive in this race, and we're talking about prosecutors. But you're right, Sam. I mean, it was, it was, and the other question is whether or not Biden really thinks he needs that base. Clearly, the polls right now are showing that the base is, I mean, Angela Davis is supporting Joe Biden, and Noam right. Chomsky is supporting Joe Biden because, you know, Donald Trump is crushing all of us. Right. So I don't know. Right. Okay, but I mean, what what uh, what she she would would she be in the same position right now? She's she's very much viable for the VP position. I mean, had she had she endorsed is. Bernie Sanders, she would be far more viable. Well, do you think that that Biden actually cares about what Bernie's people think? I don't know. I mean, Take a look I, at Biden's numbers. Where is he weakest? Yeah, with young people, correct? Where is he yeah, weakest right. in terms of uh, uh, in in small dollar fundraising amongst young people? Where you know where, how is right. he doing with activist? I mean, of course, of course, he wants those people. The question is, is how much does he feel he needs them at this point? And the question is, is like you know what is he willing to pay? And and if and and Elizabeth right. Warren, if you know what is her what is her value add to him? Theoretically, she can deliver those people. That's the pitch that she's making. And that's what, you know, we see the polls that her people are pushing that suggest that. Well, it would be a lot less of a question as to whether she could deliver that had she endorsed Bernie Sanders. Mm-hmm. And it was it was the the my biggest complaint with Elizabeth Warren in that race. Not that she was trying to win at different times, even if she's trying to win past the time that it was possible. I mean, look. As far as I'm concerned, all these politicians are driven by their ego. They think they're the best person to do the job. I think, you know, the relationship between Bernie and Warren, uh, frankly, I think it's been overstated in terms of how friendly they are, et cetera, et cetera. I think they both, you know, wanted to be president. 
and that's their prerogative. They can do that. But what I was disappointed in Elizabeth Warren with was her seeming like her tin ear and her inability to see opportunities that were sitting there for her. And those opportunities that she specifically missed were twofold. One was that she did not appreciate the fact that she didn't have to respond to the Twitter chatter that was going on out there about where's the finer points of your funding for Medicare. She didn't have to respond to that. She did in the same way. She didn't have to respond to, you know, are you really a uh, native American? I mean, that was, that projected a weakness and B she also didn't understand where a lot of her electoral value came from. She made the mistake of thinking that 2020 was the same as 2016. In 2016, she sat out endorsing Bernie and Clinton, and that helped her. And the reason why she was able to get away with that at that time, because there was an understanding that Bernie's people were also her people, more or less. Okay, they had basically wanted to draft Warren. They didn't come. And then those people went over to Bernie. And there was still a belief that she had a salience with those people. She did not understand that was her value to a politician. She's very good at the inside game. She grew up in a in a uh, in an academic um, uh, environment where inside politics are huge. But at a in, in academia, you don't have to worry about whether students are for you or against you because you're working in a different type of environment. She did not realize that her big value add proposition was the ability to deliver Bernie voters. And they're trying to sell her that way now, right? I mean, they're not, nobody's saying you're gonna, you, you wanna pick Elizabeth Warren because you're, she's gonna bring a certain expertise in financial regulation to the ticket. No, people are saying you want uh, Elizabeth Warren there because she's gonna deliver the youth vote. Well, there would have been no better way of making that argument than if she had endorsed Bernie Sanders. And her failure to do that is upsetting uh, or, or is problematic to me, not because uh, I think like, you know, she owed it to Bernie to do that or whatever, because strategically it made the most sense for her. Right. And her inability to see the politics associated with that make me a little bit concerned about her ability to do that type of like, I guess you would call that a wholesale or retail politics. Well, and if you think about right now, the other vice presidential picks that are more establishment. So what Joe Biden was essentially promising, you know, appealing with centrists is he's able to potentially win back those Trump voters that would have potentially gone to, to, to Bernie Sanders. They both appeal to this, this group of voters that did not like Hillary Clinton. And my guess is they probably won't like the other people on the other women on the list or frankly, any women, but they might have liked Warren a little bit more if she had endorsed Bernie and that bringing them over. So it's not just about the youth vote. It's that you're bringing the youth vote and you're able to keep that that group of Trump voters. Yeah, Shay, yeah. Exactly, which is what made Biden uh, the, the more you know appealable candidate. But he might lose those votes if he goes with somebody else, like Kamala Harris, who's like a California liberal in their minds. I mean, I don't know that I don't know that the, that the VP pick has that much uh, power or not. We don't we don't really know. But I think that like, um, you know, certainly if you're the if you're the presidential nominee, you want one that's going to increase your chances. I mean, that's you, and, and, you know, even if you're not if you can't prove that someone's going to help or hurt, you just presume that the the decision is important. Um, uh, go ahead, John. OK, so so she had. Two things going for her, at least one is she was more popular more people knew her than any other candidate and so that that's still a huge advantage for the vp pick right now knew her uh, as a, and, a, aside from biden and uh and and bernie you mean right right i mean i'm, right, I'm okay. talking about potential vp picks i mean oh. i think i in my mind she made this decision that she couldn't win and she wanted to be VP and that's why she stabbed Bernie in the back. Okay. And but then, that doesn't make sense. 
I mean, it's... Well, I mean, that's what you said back then. And you said I was completely wrong. And now we fast forward today and she... No, right of course she running. wants to be VP. But I'm saying that the reason why she didn't endorse Bernie, I don't think that necessarily had to do with being, uh, with, with wanting to be VP. I mean, I, I just don't think that she, I, I mean, after, after Super Tuesday, I mean, Bernie wasn't, I mean, you know, everybody knows, I mean, people say in cult of Bernie. Hey, maybe she didn't want to endorse Bernie because she was mad because maybe, maybe here's an alternate theory for you, John. Maybe Bernie did say, I don't think a woman can win in this environment. Maybe, maybe he did. Maybe he didn't, but maybe he didn't like, she didn't like the fact that she was basically, you know, um, you know, uh, he, he refused to concede that maybe, I mean, we don't know. All I can tell you is that like, if her assessment was, if I don't endorse Bernie, I'm going to have a better shot of being VP. She's got a real problem understanding how like these type of politics worth uh, work because the value she's bringing to that ticket is only that she could bring the Bernie people. There was no other value that she had to Joe Biden. And think about if Bernie had endorsed her as VP after the race and how much more powerful she'd be in this moment right now. I mean, at that point, after Super Tuesday, I mean, as much as I love Bernie, I mean, he really did not look very good. You know, on the, after Super Tuesday, you look at the polling for the 10th, that, that primary that happened. I know. I mean, I was I talked to all, all of y'all on the show and things were looking pretty bad. And right, ended up right, worse right. In the polling. So she saw that. And I mean, why should she endorse somebody who has, I'm, I, mind, because no John, I'll tell you why you endorse somebody like that because it ingratiates you with the second biggest pot of voters and particularly a cohort that you know, if, if this is what your theory is, that she knows Joe Biden's going to be the eventual nominee, well, you've got to sit back and say, what is Joe Biden going to need? Is he going to need somebody? Is he Okay, he's going to need a woman, but there are a half a dozen women that roll off the tongue as to who he could pick. And particularly if you're a white woman, like, you know, it's, it's uh, on some level, it's a deficit, I think, in the context of how Joe Biden won, because he won uh, basically because of, of black votes across the country. What is he going to need? He's going to need the youth vote. Who has the youth vote? The person that I think is losing. I will endorse that person. Therefore, knowing that they that I have now become one of the uh, potential champions of that group. I mean, what you're saying is that that she just look, that could have been her thinking or not. But who knows? All I'm saying is, is that, you know, I made this argument. I know you made the argument, John, but I'm telling you, where's the evidence reason why I felt that she could she would do this, you know, and at the time, if you remember the conversation, I was very much. I don't remember the conversation, John, but but John, I don't understand what your point is. She wants to be VP. I would have said she wanted to be VP. I know she wanted to be Hillary's VP, too. Of course, she wanted to be VP. But that doesn't right, mean right. that her calculation that it's if I don't endorse Bernie, I've got a better shot at VP. That's absurd. Well, I mean, we're talking about something that happened three weeks later. You know, this this happened, you know, on the 10th is originally. I, I, this, I, sorry, I think on the 11th. I, John, the actually the, with this conversation, honestly, it's just not worth the amount of time that we're investing in it at this point. She wants to be VP. She may be VP. If she is, it's only going to be because she can supposedly deliver a cohort of voters that Biden's worry he can't get. And that's going to be. The issue with Warren has always been her path has always been extremely narrow. And so when one path closed, there's another path that's also extremely narrow that she's trying to, you know. But let me let me say this, too. Even if what you're suggesting is correct, that she didn't endorse um, uh, Bernie because it was clear that Bernie was going to lose and she wanted to uh, ingratiate herself with Biden so that she would be um a vp which is what you're saying right because it was clear that bernie's going to lose at that point right i said that on the 7th okay of okay listen now this is what i would tell you so what of course of, of 
scores. Nobody was saying that at the time. No one. So I'm just, I mean, in fact, you are chiding me. You are saying. I'm chiding you, you now. I don't think it's the case. I know you are. You are saying uh, who's closer to, to our policy, Bernie or Biden? Of course it was Bernie. And I'm saying she's not doing it because of policy. She's doing it because of ambition and power. I have well, no doubt. I'm pretty I'm sure just... I was saying at the time she was doing it because, you know, Obama and she wanted to stay on the good side of all those people. I mean, I had a general take with you. It wasn't just you saying things like that. But I, I mean, I, I, John, if you want credit for saying that, you got it. If that's what this is about, but uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say goodbye now, but I do appreciate the phone call. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. I also remember, seem to remember that Obama and Warren had a lot of tiffs. So it's not like there's a lot of love there. No, I I mean, I've heard, (laughs) you know, like I, I, I I think if, if Bernie, if, if her assessment and John's assessment was that Bernie couldn't win then, then like what like then and she wanted to um if she wanted to uh appeal to uh biden why didn't she endorse biden right i mean where does where does the calculation come like she, oh, and she wasn't pulling from bernie i mean that's what we have to remember and it was it's very hard for bernie people to really get this she wasn't pulling from bernie she was actually like most of her support without the vocal people online that we all know right was upper middle class wealthy educated voters who were most likely not going to end up siding with bernie if not the majority so at the end of the day you know this was a this was a crazy field still in january this is before california which he swept so yeah the path was i mean at that point bernie was coming in strong he was likely to do very well if not win iowa was likely to win new hampshire was likely to win nevada uh, didn't win in New Hampshire, but, um, you know, and then in California, he was, he was killing it. So I just don't, I don't think anybody thought Bernie didn't have a chance in January. And it definitely wasn't Elizabeth Warren. And, you know, I think like, you know, there's sometimes it's very difficult. You're running for office and the idea is like, I can win. Yeah. Uh, here's a scenario. Like I've got a whole team of people who are basically working on, here's the scenario right. that you That's can win. Right. It's one in 30, but you know, right. Donald Trump was a long shot, too. That's right. Um, and don't forget, Biden was very weak at that point. So why would you be doing favors for Biden when he was, like, coming in, like, seventh place? And it, it didn't make sense. No, I'm not, I, 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 I continue to disagree with that. Um, here's, here's another. Uh, here's something. This is a little bit of a field. But well, when was it? Was it yesterday that we were talking about Eric? Yeah, of course. It was yesterday that we were talking about. Do you know these Weinstein brother guys? Yeah. Not the ones, not the, not the, uh, <laughs> not the uh, Miramax people, but yeah. Brett uh, Weinstein, who was the, the guy from Evergreen College who was very yeah. upset. Uh, he felt like uh, there was a uh, problem with uh, transgender uh, stuff, or I, I can't even. No, he remember. was a, he, there was symbolic acts of a day of absence that he thought was an uh, attack on whiteness. Oh, I, okay. So you had an issue with, uh, with um, you know, unnecessary uh, demonization of white people, I guess, or something uh, that uh, by some, you know, by, by college students. And, um, and so he uh, built his uh, career there as someone who was disaffected. And then his brother uh, got in on the whole thing. Uh, you know, he, he works for Peter Thiel and um, they became, you know, members of the IDW, I guess. Um, and, for years, well, one of the members of the IDW was Dave Rubin, and um, yesterday, I was talking about like why Eric Weinstein is still bringing me up in these interviews as someone who is is problematic. It just seems like, first of all, in these, if he was really talking to intellectuals, with all due respect to me, they'd have no idea who who he's talking about if he would bring up Sam Cedar as an example of something, I'm sorry. It's just like in intellectual circles, you know, I'll interview some people, but I, I'm sorry with all due respect. They, they'd be referencing Barry Weiss. Let's just right. be very yeah, clear. I mean, like, no, you'd be talking about, I mean, like this, they, they're the, the intellectuals are not limited to the world of people who are on YouTube. I should say that right now. Okay. And uh, then you don't get people, clicks, Sam. That's particularly for people who are in their fifties, okay? <laughs> and and so, and I uh, um, 
hypothesized yesterday that based upon a phone call I had had with Eric Weinstein like a year ago, or I don't know when it was, maybe last summer, where he was really dissing uh, uh, Dave Rubin uh, in some in some not so subtle ways, uh, explicit ways. <laughs> and I got the sense that like maybe what's going on here since Dave Rubin had moved to, over to Beck's, uh, you know, uh, Glenn Beck's uh, operation, the blaze, and had announced that he was going to run for president, you know, that he was going to support Donald Trump for president, Dave Rubin was, that maybe Eric Weinstein wants to get into the Dave Rubin slot, essentially. He sees a market opening, and he knows that part of that is like, I'm just going to pick up, I'm just going to take Dave's bet noir, essentially. And I thought, eh, it's a theory. But then... This thing comes out. This is his brother on his on his brother's podcast, which apparently he does with his wife. Uh, And um, listen to this. I've been shocked at the proclivity of so many of my friends to subscribe wholeheartedly to the woke mentality. Do you think intellect and attention to detail has anything to do with the political choices people make? Pause it. Listen to that question. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> I put judgment aside for a moment. The question is, is like, I can't believe my friends who are so woke. Uh, do you think personality has anything to do with ideology? That's the question. And look at like where Brett Weinstein takes this to. There's so much happening. I've been shocked at the proclivity of so many of my friends to subscribe wholeheartedly to the woke mentality. Do you think intellect and attention to detail has anything to do with the political choices people make? Um, so this was one of these things uh, I often reference that Eric once said to me. In fact, I think I've called it the smartest thing anyone ever said, which was <laughs> truth is the second best strategy. And by that, he meant that um, social affiliation, that is to say, signing on to what the group that has power wants you to say in order that it will share its power with you, is often a much better strategy than truth. So All right, what it pause is it for one second. Going on I just want to break this down because this is so, these are just like non sequitur applied upon non sequiturs. It's, um, it really feels forced on some level. So the question is, do you think uh, intellect and attention to detail is a, uh, a bulwark against wokeism? That's basically the question, right? Like, you know, um, do your fa- <laughs> you know, my, uh, you know, uh, my facts don't care about your feelings is basically what the question is. And he turns it to strategy. And what is the strategy that he's talking about? Like when you strategize something, you want a goal and he calls it power. But I think it's probably what he's talking about in the context of this world that we we inhabit is clout. What is power in the YouTube podcast world, which is what I think he's really talking about because their whole (laughs) world is sort of like narrowly defined as that. And that is like clicks and celebrity yeah. Yeah. And, and then maybe money ultimately, but, but clicks and celebrity. So just like, I just want people to understand like the, where like track his, his thinking here. Okay. Is that I think is going on with those who don't sign up with this. It's one of two things. Either they have correctly realized that they could get somewhere in the short term by signing on, but that they will ultimately be, confronted by this thing in the end so it's not a good deal or they are sticklers for the truth and the fact is i think all of us sticklers for the truth are i don't want to call us broken but we we do not have the circuit that allows you to just simply socially affiliate no matter what kind of nonsense it forces to come out of your mouth okay now i want you to go back here but what he's saying is that like there's two types of people some people who go along to get that power and we'll, we'll join the herd, essentially, and espouse this stuff. But then there's people like us who are so wedded to the truth that we're almost broken. It's like a humble brag here. We're so wedded to the truth that, um, that we actually, um, we don't just make social affiliations as, a, uh, you know, that we let, we only, we demand that the truth take us where we want to go. All right. And so that's where what he's saying here. And again, it, it's not really what the question was. The question was about intellect and attention to detail, but he's turned it into like a social strategy where I'm not 
successful, he's saying, in part, I'm not powerful because I'm so wedded to the truth that I'm broken in this game that I have talked about what the best strategy is. It's not a good deal. Or they are sticklers for the truth. And the fact is, I think all of us sticklers for the truth are, I don't want to call us broken, but we, we do not have the circuit that allows you to just simply socially affiliate no matter what kind of nonsense it forces to come out of your mouth, right? Some people do. And the fact that they say some crazy thing um, and everybody cheers assures them that it must be right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this can happen all over the place. Um, you know, there's some danger, you know, in the case of Dave Rubin, for example, that what? he's hearing, you know, the uh, cheers of a bunch of people who are all concentrated in one mindset. And he thinks that what he's saying is making sense. And in fact, it seems to be making less sense over time as he's moving closer to a group that is united behind ideas that are not robust. Closer to a different ideology than one that he formerly, formerly ascribed to, but um, seems to be a jump from ideology to ideology rather than to more first principles thinking. Yeah. And awesome. you know now, okay, so <laughs> this is just amazing. Can you imagine, can you imagine <laughs> talking about something about like social dynamics and just using Dave Rubin as like your <laughs> pivot point? It's just bizarre. And the, and the amazing thing is like, he's not naming, there's nothing, the only thing specific that he's talking about is this individual. You know, these guys are supposed to be about ideas and this and that. And all he's saying is the idea is not robust. In other words, Dave Rubin now subscribes to bad ideas. Yeah. And, and uh, it's, name because, it's because there's a group of people who appreciate his bad ideas. Like he doesn't, he doesn't get specific it, about it. Like this is like literally like. It could know, be said in two sentences, essentially. No, like no that's just so no furious. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and I guess his, uh, his uh, wife, I don't know, I don't know her name, uh, Heather. She says, um, she says that, well, he's just moved from ideology to ideology. I don't know what the first ideology was, right? Presumably the ideology he had was the one that was shared by the IDW. But she then says there's no first principles, which suggests that maybe there was no first principles in the first adoption of the ideology he had. Or are they arguing that they're not ideological at all? It's just that he went from the left uh, to the right or something. But we can't know because there's no specificity in this conversation whatsoever. At all. <laughs> Sound not robust closer to a different ideology than one that he formerly formerly ascribed to but um seems to be a jump from ideology to ideology rather than to more first principles thinking yeah and you know he, i've seen him of late attack chloe yeah he's attacked uh josephine matthias mm -hmm. no idea there's nothing there's no reason <laughs> we know both of these people my incredibly, sister. Incredibly <laughs> bright, incredibly insightful, and frankly open to other perspectives. Both yep. of them have that characteristic in spades. So why, you know, on what basis could you possibly attack them? Well, oh. to the extent that he has now moved in the direction of um, an ideology that can't abide voices like theirs, he now can't even hear what they're saying. What are they saying? SNL skit, guys. This is ridiculous. I mean, is Alec Baldwin about... going to come out? <laughs> he's talking about. He's talking about like, you know, social affiliation, and people fall into that trap. And then he's just saying, like, you know, pointing out, like, they haven't talked about an idea. It's all just like. Jargon. Dave is made fun of uh, Chloe and Jenny, and uh, <laughs> how could you possibly? How could you possibly criticize them? Yeah. And they're, they're so open to different ideas, and how could you possibly make fun of them? And but meanwhile, Heather just said that the reason the problem they have with Dave is that he just moved from ideology to ideology, which suggests that he's open to ideas, but those aren't robust ideas. I'm just saying that like. He's picking on our friends and we know them. They're cool. And so how could you pick on that? It's so weird. <laughs> and he moved to the other ideology because other people are listening to that ideology. 
That's right. Can't forget that. Right. Uh, oh my and, god. And 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 the IDW thing has been the world's greatest marketing, uh, you know, mechanism. And uh, let's just see the let tail end of the, that oh. again. Oh, he? Yeah. He's attacked uh, Josephine Matthias. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, there's no reason. We know both of these people. <laughs> incredibly decent, incredibly bright, incredibly insightful, and frankly, open to other perspectives. Both yep. of them have that characteristic in spades. So why, you know, on what basis could you possibly attack them? Well, to the extent that he has now moved in the direction of um, an ideology that can't <laughs> abide voices like theirs, he now can't even hear what they're saying yeah, yeah. if the primary <laughs> it's, like it's, it's like they won't talk about like conservatism like it's like lord voldemort we can't <laughs> say the name what did they do before anybody have a sense because you know well, they're, they're, they're it's academics. just reheated dave rubin stuff oh what did they do yeah they yeah. were both evergreen academics and they left and the whole evergreen affair of course okay yeah it's that was stunning to me that i mean look and here's the thing. I want to make this absolutely clear. What we do on this show, on, particularly in the fun half, is this kind of like AM talk radio. I dip into conservatives. I mock them. I try and put it. And, and I, I do so. I, I put that out up front. Like I'm not uh, pretending anything else is going on here when we do these, when we do those segments. There are other parts of the show that I don't do that. I interview a historian or I interview a policymaker, an epidemiologist, whatever it is. But in this part of the show, we're doing some of this stuff. I'm going to put it on YouTube. And we are specifically trying to show the ridiculousness and the holes and mock these people. We're, we're, we're trying to do that. Now, I know this is beneath them. They just talk about ideas being robust as opposed to like my word, which is like, this is idiotic. Yeah. And they don't they, they, and, and, and they don't talk about personalities except for like how could you talk uh, how could you possibly make fun of Margie and uh, Gwendolyn? <laughs> They're wonderful people. I, we know them. I mean, I, I'm I'm explicit about it. I, I you know I don't I don't pretend to be something that I'm not. These guys, if you're an intellectual, and the words Dave Rubin come out of your mouth in anything other than like i can't believe the new york times would write a piece on this charlatan from day one if you are an intellectual and you didn't you weren't aware that dave rubin was a charlatan it's because he was welcoming you on his show and you are now guilty of the very thing that you were indicting him for which is oh i have access now to his audience and his platform these guys are all charlatans mm -hmm. If you're an intellectual and you can't cite anything, then you're not an intellectual. It's weird. It's, it's unrobust. It's, like it's just like floating over any kind of specificity. It's just hilarious. It's, it's like, it's, really... I can't wait to see Pete Buttigieg move into that space because I feel like he's perfect for it. It's such a weird combination of things too to like give the sort of like highfalutin, slow, like didactic sort of delivery of just absolutely nothing, of air basically. I just think that Gwen and Barbara are wonderful people, and it's amazing that they could be attacked on what grounds? <laughs> I don't know, some crazy ideological grounds, which we won't get into. Just because... First ideology. I mean, we were talking about just this... Just because Barbara took Kevin to the prom? <laughs> like, it, I don't this, get it. This is sub-progressive voice. Like, at least the progressive voice, he dissects the actual arguments and gets into the meat of the stuff this is just like how dare he criticize <laughs> it's unbelievable but i do appreciate and i will say this as a coda i do appreciate that these guys are basically like you know eric uh said uh, on rogan show that i was you know zeroing in on 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 uh, dave rubin as a wounded antelope and i was separating him from the herd so that i could slaughter him i guess and presumably walk off and, and, and feast on him like a jackal um, but I do appreciate these guys are now taking the carcass and swooping in and picking at it. <laughs> Actually, that's Dave Rubin's skull on the on the table. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> oh my god, that's funny. <laughs> that's so also, also the juxtaposition of like their their set, like it's so manly in the bandana, and then they're like, but really, Gwendolyn must be. What is this? It's so strange. It's so strange. 
Um, here's Donald Trump. Let's let's play a couple of these uh, Donald Trump uh, back to back uh, gems. Did you know that Donald Trump not only saved the oil industry, he created it. Obviously. Yeah. With his blubber. to hold the convention in Jacksonville with, with all this virus spread. Well, we're going to see it built up a little bit, but we're going to do something that will be great. We think we're doing very well. We had some poll numbers a little while ago that are great. You know, it's the same story. It's uh, suppression polls that we had in 2016, phony polls, uh, fake news, phony polls, same thing. And we're doing very well. We're doing well in Georgia. We're doing well in Texas. I've read uh, where I was one point up in Texas. I'm not one point up in Texas. We're many points up. I saved the oil industry. Two months ago, I saved the oil industry. They would have been, I created it. We became number one. We have millions of jobs and we saved it. So Texas is not going to have to let go of millions and millions of people. Oklahoma, uh, North Dakota, many states. Uh, we have, we're at $40 a barrel and yet you can buy gasoline for under two dollars nobody's ever seen like that so we have the biggest energy in the world we're number one in oil as you know oil and gas by far we're now number one in the world and we would have had millions of people out of work i saved it and then they say i'm leading by one point in texas they said you know what's interesting uh no me you tell me um you're i know you're not a uh, psychiatrist or a psychologist uh, my understanding is you're not a doctor in any way uh, whatsoever, but you are someone who talks to other human beings. Mm -hmm. um, if I ask you about Jacksonville, Florida and uh, the RNC convention, what's going on in your mind if you spend the rest of the time talking about how you're actually up more than one point in, uh, in Texas? What might be uh, your anxieties? Is that an insight into your anxieties, perhaps? I mean, Florida does happen to be the worst place on the planet right now uh, to go in terms of the pandemic. And um, I'd be concerned that I'd be losing in Florida. And I think that a convention there, uh, even with the people who might die as a result of going to the convention, could, could you know, potentially affect uh, the numbers in Florida because but it's if, all about uh, But polls. you've just talked about Florida, and I asked you yeah. about Florida. But if yeah. you pivot immediately to Texas and it's Oklahoma, uh, do you think that maybe on his mind he's a little bit worried about states that should be like completely out of the question for Joe Biden or the Democratic nominee to win? I mean, uh, well, Oklahoma course. and Texas shouldn't even be on the table. Of course, but with that being said, they're still having a convention. So I know he's trying to distract away, but subtext here is maybe they're not going to have the convention. So I know maybe I'm jumping all over here, but what I'm trying to say is yes, polls are bad in Florida. Florida is the pandemic capital, but you have the convention in a month. He's not ready to answer that question. He pivots away, talks about Texas and Oklahoma, safer states, but even though they're, they've been hit by the pandemic. So there. There you go. All right. Maybe I'm going deeper, but no. I don't think convention's going to happen. I think they're going to cancel it. You, oh, you think? Is that right? Yeah. Oh, that'll be interesting. That's going to be a big, I mean, look. Or like the, doing what the Dems do, basically. They may uh, cancel the convention and with the hope that like nobody will remember how they were, you know, sort of like so bold in talking about the convention and the implications of it. And it's also equally possible that people will not remember when Donald Trump said multiple times, we don't need testing. I don't want testing. We fired the, uh, the, the czar of testing. Uh, testing just gives you more cases and we don't need that. And that's a huge mistake to pivoting to like, well, the reason why we don't have testing is of course, because the last president was not American. His name was Barack Obama. Here is Donald Trump responding to the question about testing. President Trump, you've said many times that the number of coronavirus cases is going up because testing is increasing. That's right. Do you acknowledge that it's going up for other reasons, too? For example, that it's actually spreading? And what are you going to do to stop the spread? Well, you know that we have one of the lowest mortality rates anywhere. If you know Biden and Obama stopped their testing, they just stopped it. You probably know that. I'm sure you don't want to report it. But uh, they stopped testing. Uh, right in the middle, they just went no more testing and uh, on a much lesser problem than the problem that we have, obviously, with respect to uh, this is the worst thing that's happened since probably 1917. This is a very bad. Thing. All over the world, it's 188 countries right now. But no, we are we test more than anybody by far. 
And when you test, you create cases. So we've created cases. Uh, I can tell you some countries, they test when somebody walks into a hospital sick or walks into maybe a doctor's office, but usually a hospital. That's the testing they do, so they don't have cases. Whereas we do, we have all of these cases. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword. At the same time, we have the lowest mortality or just about the lowest mortality in the world. Uh, we're doing a great job. We're doing very well. Yeah. You remember when Biden and Obama stopped testing right in the middle of whatever uh, thing that didn't happen? Yes. They stopped. Ta- was, I, I they mean, were president you, last year. I don't know if you know he, that. In was he talking about year. SARS or he may be talking about SARS or something like or MERS? Benghazi, the Benghazi break. <laughs> they stopped testing right, you know, uh, right in the middle of the non-pandemic. They stopped. He testing. looks horrible. He looks like I don't think I've ever seen him look so bad. And that's. He's, he, he looks like he might be a little depressed. Folks, yeah. we don't have time for any more calls. Got to go uh, do a couple of IMs and then we'll get out of here. Brendan, phone number. <laughs> Sam, can you please turn your mic up? Also, have you guys considered returning to the studio yet or does that risk still outweigh the benefit? Uh, I mean, for the most part, I don't want uh, you know, to bring in a bunch of people into the studio every day. We're in a building that is um, full of people. It is not a... Um, uh, strictly, it's not, it's, it's a mixed use building and, uh, it's, we're on, on a, um, we got to go into an elevator. There's a lot of issues. And, um, so we're not, we're not thinking about doing that until probably, uh, August at the earliest, but more likely uh, September. Uh, and then we'll see, I mean, who knows? Uh, I miss it. I do miss it though. Benito. By the last time you read this, I'll be in the middle of taking the LSAT. Show far, please. You got it. Whoa, whoa, la. The average size of the coronavirus is 125 nanometers. CO2 molecule is 232 picometers. That means the coronavirus is 540 times larger than a CO2. Okay. There you go. Uh, Glass Siegel, I saw Tim Poole yelling at anti-BLM people for being too deferential and using too little force, basically goading them into violence against protesters. He's a real piece of garbage. I think the wolf from his hat is rotting his brain. Uh, I'll take video of that if you have it. Josh from Chicago, if you're in Maine's 37th district, my friend Grayson Luckner is a socialist running for state rep. Also, while you're at it, vote for Betsy Sweet as part of the progressive ticket for, for Senate. Five more of these. Uh, Thomas, Minneapolis. My mom in South Carolina is a school nurse. Got recruited a month ago to do contract ta- uh, contact tracing for the state. Said it was a disorganized crap show filled with red tape. And after two weeks, she stopped hearing from the people organizing it. Now the state's calling her again, begging her to come to work in a COVID wing as the ICUs are full. Boy, apparently, a lot of nurses are walking out on COVID care because they don't trust their employers to take care of them. Jeez. Winnipeg Craig, I don't uh, recall if you had him on uh, for his book, but I'm just getting through The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis this week, and it's a great insight of how badly the Trump administration's transition into government hobbled the federal government's capacity to deal with emergencies. Pretty relevant in the age of COVID. Um, Brendan, take a note on that. Uh, a couple more. Uh, Barah for me too. Please, please don't take this question as criticism. Michael seems like he's becoming less and less a part of the show. Uh, plus when are the Cedar 2022 bumper stickers coming out? They would not, first of all, I'll take the first one last. The bumper stickers would never come out before, uh, the 2020 election. Um, and, uh, Michael is, comes in every Wednesday and Thursday, which he's been doing for oh, six Thursday. months. Huh? He, he hosts, the hosts show on, on Thursday. Thursday. Joanna. An oxygen molecule is 120 picometers, and, uh, de- and a COVID-19 is 120 nanometers. The virus is a thousand times large. So we have a couple of different uh, discrepancies on the relative sides, but it's at least 500 to a thousand times larger. Uh, Angel the Australian, look, Angel the Australian, look, my country's leadership is a bucket of. Uh, of ass clowns. And that said, if any Australian needs to get tested and they're told they have to pay for it, I would suggest start flipping tables and say, pay for it. I already paid, paid for it. This is Australia, not the USA. Now stick a swab in me. Three more, uh, Doug in Denver, Bastille day, Viva la France. 
Teacher, for Sam, where are you on your evolution from Warren apologist to an anar anarchist? Uh, what edible is good for being productive, writing, playing, painting guitar? I love smoking most, but it aggravates my allergies. I, 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 don't, I can't answer um, the edible. And uh, I don't know that uh, I was ever a Warren apologist. Uh, I, my feelings of Warren have not changed. I, I'm not an apologist for anybody, as far as I'm concerned. A square. Uh, know me interested in the Hamilton take. I'm aware of the issues with Miranda's, but after watching the musical recently, I wish we could allow space for the value that the recasting the script as an art form and politically. It's actually surprised to see how clearly it sheds light on the pettiness, flaws, and ego of the white founding fathers, both Hamilton and Jefferson in particular. Definitely watch the, uh, definitely watch Matt's take. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Three more. SL Screen uh, tonight we riot as a video game developed by the Pixel Pushers Union. Could be an interesting interview to talk to them about the difficulties in making games as a union shop. Rachel was right. Nomi says Bernie supporters were trying to mend relationship with Warren supporters. Really? By that time, asking Warren supporters to vote for Bernie was like asking them to support their abuser. Uh, I meant like in the last few weeks that there's been some... Some, some reproachment, as yes, they're often is. Exactly. Particularly with the I'm like... From like the, the staffing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the final I am of the day. Warren is a loser. We're already proved she has no political acumen. Trump already outsmarted her on the DNA test. Her refusal to endorse at the critical time will always sour Bernie voters on her. CFPB is toothless and she couldn't even get on it. I disagree with your assessment of the CFPB. Right now, everything is toothless in this uh, government. Uh, just check out what's happening with with uh, the Treasury Department. There was a in their investigation in redlining. But the CFPB is still actually pretty uh, strong. She got third in her home state. That is also true. All right, folks. Nomi, thank you so much. Matt, thank Brendan, you. good job, guys. Check out Nomi's show. Find out what is so wrong with Hamilton from Matt Stoller, one of the OG anti-Hamiltonians. <laughs> All right, folks, see you tomorrow. <clears throat> Strength like a to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. Seeing the truth and